Oh, hello there. It's the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. Good to know. It's the Agostino Zinger Show, episode number 505 with I, your host, Agostino Zinger, and I hope you're feeling well, wherever you may be. And if you're wondering how I'm doing, I'm doing pretty fine, all things considered, all things considered. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, via the podcast app, you know what to do. You know the dealio. Smash that like, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below if you like and he- like what you hear, like what you see, and all that good stuff. And of course, if you listen via the podcast app, a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 star review on the podcast app would be greatly appreciated. I don't care what rating you give me, just give me a rating, interact with it, get me popped up on the algorithm, and I'll be more, more than grateful for your support, really would be. And of course, support for your patrons welcome to at patreon.com forward slash agostino you get all my patron exclusive content only available as course on patreon for as little as one dollar the equivalent of one pound per month you get access to all my bonus content there's going to be content coming on there at the end of this week so hopefully saturday evening i shall have some new content on there as well so make sure you jump on there don't delay at patreon.com for just agostino you'll be able to find the link in the description of this video and also find a link as well in the description of the podcast app wherever you might be listening to it and i hope you do that i hope you do that my friends but yeah, how's it going, man? Hope you're well, wherever you may be. Hope you're good. Um, I'm testing out a little new angle, a little new crop on my um, OBS to record this video portion of this um, podcast. If you're listening via the audio version, you won't have noticed, but the camera is really zoomed in and cropped into my face. Now, my big wide face is cropped right in and it's cropped right in the center and it's right bang in the middle and it's in your face. Forgive me for that, but I'm trying, okay? I'm trying to make this a little bit more... Um, I'm trying to improve the quality of it, you know, do some tweaks and whatnot. There's a new camera coming in the next few weeks. So hopefully you'll see me in much brighter light. Hopefully going to get a ring light as well, just to kind of add some more light. So I'm not so dark over here and people don't feel I look like a flipping midnight shadow or whatever. I promise you I'm much lighter in real life. <laughs> I think I am anyway. I think I am. But regardless of that, small improvements, tiny improvements, please forgive me. If you don't like it and it's too close, let me know in the comments. If you think it's too far, also let me know in the comments and I'd be greatly appreciate any kind of feedback you give me in that regard but apart from that how have I been pretty decent um today's been pretty slow um pretty chill not much doing really um Friday nights have kind of changed um because I'm recording this on a Friday in case whenever you listen so I'd like to date myself but why not um I don't you know my kind of uh my flow has been disturbed somewhat with the lack of DJ bookings and stuff from the bars and pubs I used to play in. It seems as if most of these places have either A, moved on, or they've just stopped kind of, you know, booking people in the way that they're booking them beforehand. And I think it's probably a mixture of both, but mostly on the latter. The bars and pubs I've been to, again, I'm not playing in massive clubs. I was doing some warehouse things here and there, but most of those are personal relationships. And seeing as I haven't really kept in contact with some of those people or some, pe- some of those people have kind of fallen out with, it's not really the best um, thing to kind of hit up somebody you don't talk to or somebody that doesn't like you and say, hey, do you mind booking me for a warehouse party sometime soon? That isn't going to happen. That isn't going to happen. So because of that, I've just been left in the lurch, kind of the situation i'm in now at the moment so it's a bit shit but if i'm honest i'm not taking it too personally because the bars and pubs that i've been to especially the kind of ones that i would usually play at they've never really they were always a struggle to kind of get going before covid right now even more so people are kind of going there just to get drunk and go home they're not necessarily going there to have like a cheeky boogie and if you if you're completely honest if you're a bar and you're a pub and you survived this long without djs you've probably been able to figure out how to put together a pretty decent spotify playlist most djs have, have kind of pivoted away from maybe playing out a lot and have kind of did decide to do other things like playlist they've also decided to do maybe mix series uh, live streams online mix series whatever they may be right so th- there's loads of material out there if you're like a bar owner to kind of grab a hole that you can kind of use to supplement um you know to kind of fill the space you know fill the void fill the emptiness and people are doing that nowadays so it's difficult to kind of justify paying me 50 100 pounds whatever it may be to come play for a few hours because you could just save that money pocket that money and just kind of get a good playlist going and people wouldn't really notice that much and especially if people are not really going out to rave and to dance in your club anyway on your bar on your pub um they're just going to have a drink and maybe have a couple of nibbles maybe see some cute girls cute guys and keep it moving have a couple of cheeky bumps in the toilets and that's it so i'm not necessarily i'm not i'm quite expendable in that regard so it's been a little bit you know it's been a little bit of a bummer that way but i've noticed it has kind of spoiled or it has kind of ruined my rhythm of going out because like i mentioned beforehand 
I'd be I'd be doing gigs from like Thursday to Sunday, sometimes Friday to Saturday, sometimes you know Wednesday to Friday, whatever, right? But there'll be a three day period where I'd be going in in right. So I'll be like working nine to five. I'd come back home where I take my DJ stuff with me. Um, I'd maybe go and get something to eat. I'd maybe go prepare some last minute stuff on my laptop, and then I'd be jetting straight off to go play the set that I'm gonna go play on the Friday night. And then, of course, that will maybe end, let's say if it's a bar and pub, it usually ends anywhere between like 11 and 1 a.m. So 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. So when that ends, you didn't have the time to go out and do something else later, right? Especially when Fold Stoop first opened, um, when the course first opened, all these places first popped well, well, the course when the course was kind of popping off before the pandemic, right, really, really well, those are places I'd kind of frequent on the daily. And, of course, places like Mixed Garage sometimes, if you're able to get in there before 4 a.m. and whatnot, the places I'd be going. But that would give me the impetus to go out then that also give me the energy to do it the next day on a Saturday and then maybe again to do it again on a Sunday go to like grow or some other place and hear some people play reggae and play some afro beats in the background just chill have something nice healthy to eat as you watch people run by the canal or something right that would be kind of my, my vibe but now you know look at me yeah I mean I'm recording a podcast I'm watching stuff on on my laptop I'm just chilling reading books whatnot it's completely changed how I kind of interact with my um how I interact with nightlife in general. I'm hoping I can re I can kind of get it kick started over the next couple of weeks because I've got some things happening that I'm gonna do. Um, obviously I'm gonna have some more DJ streams that I'm gonna be putting up on my channel on YouTube. So if you haven't checked those out before, make sure you do. I'm probably gonna do one on Saturday evening. I'll put like a live little uh, alert out there for that one. So if you have not around, then make sure you check that out. I'll be playing a little live hour set there. That'd be pretty fun just to kind of get myself back in front of quote unquote people and doing stuff quote unquote live. And then, well, it was not quote unquote, it's definitely going to be live. And then, of course, going on from that, I'm also thinking whether or not I should probably start doing a night and putting some, something together that way. Um, it's been a long time since I've done one. My last proper party that I did as a promoter was maybe five, six years ago. Um, after that, I've kind of done, you know, DJ events where I've kind of booked myself and played different places and created flyers, but they're not really club nights, right? I'm not really booking many people apart from myself, maybe one person to kind of help fill up the time but i'm going to start doing that more often going forward so that's kind of the plan and um yeah man hopefully get myself kickstarted again like i said um Berghain's coming up i've got hopefully Berghain coming up at the beginning of november i'm also going to see tricks happening very soon in october there's an option maybe to see ricardo Villalobo soon there's somebody else playing in the middle of october i forgot where i want to go see too and because it's sober october it's going to be quite fun just to go see these people play get my get my little corner boogie have a little fist bump and then just bop home in it so it's going to be pretty fun it's going to be pretty fun but you know it is what it is things are moving to change everyone's kind of decided to do other things so i don't think it's that much of a bad thing in terms of what what how we are nowadays i don't think it's a bad thing i think it's just is what it is we kind of have to kind of figure out what works best for us now um that whole new normal thing is kind of right even though it's kind of cringe to say um but it is kind of right in it like we have we have basically entered the new normal we have to figure out what works best for us nowadays what doesn't work best for us and then kind of go from there really so we'll see in it we will see Anyway, jam pack show to get into. Loads of things to talk about. So get yourself a little drink, a little nibble, whatever you need to get yourself acquainted. And let's just jump in. Innit? <sighs> let's jump in. First things first, sober October, innit? It's sober October, a, a month that I usually look forward to in the same way some people look forward to um, dry January. I prefer the sober October because it's more of a challenge because usually there's loads of birthdays happening on October. There's Halloween happening on October. There's what else happening? Halloween, birthdays, ah, uh, bada, 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 bada. Loads of raves, isn't it, usually, happening around October. It feels like there's a lot of kind of underground, dark, dingy things that's going to capture your imagination. Like, even this weekend, there's, like, this, um, what's this, like, queer, LGBTQ-friendly flipping festival happening? It looks fucking amazing. It's spread over, like, six flipping venues, right? It looks fucking banging. That's happening this weekend, right? And Agassino's not going. Do you know what I mean? What is it? My is the camera not um, in focus? Hopefully it's in focus. It's in focus. Oh, yeah, it's in focus. So, and I guess, you know, isn't going, right? I'm not going to be able to go to this sort of thing because, you know, by and large, I want to get the first kind of week out of the way. With Sober October, that's usually a trick. You can usually get away with going out and not getting tempted to drink or to do drugs or do whatever that you kind of want to stop as a vice in the month if you just give yourself the first week to kind of bang out once you get that first week out the window it's usually quite hard to kind of cave into having a drink or having a shot or something it's usually easy to avoid because you're like you know what i'm not gonna waste like now what we're at day eight i'm not gonna i'm not gonna just count out the days you know that day eight and just just for the sake of having a drink do you know what i mean and it's gonna taste much sweeter on the flipping 
end of the month when I do have the opportunity to do because I think if I'm not mistaken isn't yeah if, um, Halloween is on like the 30th so if you wanted to be cheeky if you wanted to be cheeky you could go out on the Sunday right especially for me because I start work pretty late on the Monday I could go out on the Sunday get smashed and then start getting on it from the f Sunday m like Sunday you know uh, midnight wherever as it rolls into the first but you know I'm just gonna chill so there's a sick festival happening at the moment right in London here on this weekend called Body Movements Festival um and it's got amazing people playing, right? Great guests, all that good stuff. Everyone's going to have a great time, I'm, I'm assuming. And I'm obviously not going because I want to give myself this first week off to just be um, locked in, be able to do stuff that I want to do in terms of working out and all that other good stuff that I've got planned in terms of what I want to do from my uh, sober October stuff. Um, but the list of people playing is just wild. It's absolutely insane, the amount of people that are, going, that are playing here, right? Um it's a festival. I think it's spread over. Where is it? Body me one night. Da, 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 da. Where is it? Where is it? Yeah, yeah. Cool. So I'll, I'll put it up on screen quickly. Actually, and put it up on screen. Look what's happening. Body Movements is an East London queer dance festival. The multi-venue uh, mega rave spans across 16 spaces in Hackney Wick, uniting the creative minds and the movers of the LGBTQ plus dance music scene for a unique day of night programming. Collectives that have been spreading their joy, queerness for years will be side by side, working together, sharing stages, dances, energies and body movement. We've invited over 40 emerging established queer, non-binary queer, uh, non-binary trans artists to soundtrack the industrial spaces across the week in tandem with the international greats from the LGBTQ plus um, community. We are excited to present our lineup to in our com coming weeks. London has yet to see one like this body movement that is about shining light, body movements for, for my body, your body, one day, one night, six industrial stages, music from local international artists of the LGBTQI plus community, independent food and drink vendors, uh, catering for vegans, meat lovers, gluten free people and everyone in between. The spaces of a 16 spaces with a stringent queer um, respect and door policy we are taking over tamperons we're taking over tape rooms terraces breweries courtyards and so much more stage and respect policy information can be found on our website the music is going to be supporting the local and established names which contribute to lgbtq lgbtqi plus dance community in their unique way with a strong emphasis on independent collectives labels and artists who make our scene the multifaceted most important that it is this is sick right because this essentially answers the question that everyone's been arguing about over over lockdown right in terms of representation diversity in terms of just having your voice and your face and your lifestyle and your community represented in these places i think some people were speaking about it the other day on twitter about some edm festival and about how there's so many girls that go there that attend these festivals right you see them all especially these um thirsty instagram pages where they post pictures of like scantily clad girls at these flipping festivals right super attractive all these young girls hanging around having a great time but for whatever reason the dj lamps never reflect the people that actually go to these events now don't get me wrong i'm not saying all those girls that go in there are flipping djs but still you, you you can potentially find the next big star the next big person that's going to reignite that scene maybe it's in a crowd but you also just want the crowd to be reflective of the lineup because why not in it like why have a, a whole festival full of amazing looking people that span you know all different genders and races and backgrounds colors and creeds but then have the lineup be so like you know mayonnaise it doesn't make any sense and then i've always argued my thing is i've always said like, i know it's hard harder harder said harder harder said than done right harder said there or harder done than said whatever that what that term is that there should be more onus on just like setting up your own thing as opposed to moaning and complaining about these established institutions institutions because they're set up in a way that they kind of do favors for their friends like anybody that knows anything about nightlife and djing and going out and stuff you know that a lot of the a lot of the kind of bring-ins you get a lot of the opportunities you get are usually based on the uh, the kind of community that you're part of your friendships that you make the connections you make at night time which is why people say it's really crucial to kind of go out and kind of instead of just sending mixes to people go out and actually take part right take part dance have a good time um befriend people try and just like engross yourself from where the community is and then from then on you can maybe have an opportunity to kind of build and have the opportunity to maybe play in certain places but even then it's a bit cringe just kind of just try and find new friends, find new community, and then see how that goes. And obviously with that, that community you find, I've always said, why not just take that community and just do your own thing, right? You're never going to be um, on the lineup for like a time warp or these big ade festival stages they're not going to do it because their audience who they cater for is fairly middle of the road um the people that organize it don't really want to take risk which is understandable too i remember there was a press conference or a pound discussion i remember listening to a few years ago with seth Choxler and some guys from fabric and he was basically 
being quite honest about how the position that he's in, right? He's saying I want to book more new uh, DJs and acts and stuff, but I also have to be, um, I also have to be sensitive of the idea that I run Fabric. You know what I mean, I'm the head booker of Fabric. Fabric is an institution. I can't just be booking some no name person because they're not going to be able to sell tickets. And in order to make this thing work and to be able to pay people's salaries, I need tickets to be sold right it's just like a plain black and white situation but of course that no name person who's uploading soundcloud soundcloud mixes and getting like 10 listens how are they ever going to get an opportunity to play if they don't have an opportunity to play right it's a kind of a cyclical thing and again we don't have resident dj culture in the uk so it's kind of hard we're not in a bit we're not in a club you want to play anyway we don't really have that resident dj culture really that much so it's kind of hard to kind of figure out how you're going to get in anyway that being said the good thing is that there's so many venues, so many spaces available where you can kind of do your own little thing. And this is super creative. The fact that they've got 16 different stages, all in Hackney Wick. It's this really cool idea where you're able to kind of book the people that you want to book, promote that kind of sound. And then hopefully in a way, I wouldn't say re-educate the, the kind of customer base or the punters, but just offer them an alternative. That's all they need, just an alternative. And I've always said that. If you're able to offer, if you're at Time Warp, or you're at Love, Love what's, what's that thing called? Uh, not Time Warp, so you have a big one. I don't know, name another big festival, right? I just would like it if they had festival stages that just were just a little bit different from each other, right? In terms of a contrast, in terms of, okay, let's get this stage available, which is very, you know, forward thinking in terms of being LGBTQI plus friendly. And then maybe get a really standard kind of ADE time warp um, sort of, you know, circo loco kind of um, lineup. And then just give people an option. You know what I mean? Because you might you might be able to get some fans going over to that side to go over to that side. It's just it's just nice to kind of see that. And I, and I think in general, it would give your event a far better tapestry, a far better feel, a far better kind of texture. You know what I mean? When you're seeing the pictures of people, you're seeing all these amazing looking people that way. You're seeing quite regular looking kind of lads and with their flipping um, side bags on that way. I think it just makes the festival look a bit better as opposed to nowadays because all the names that are getting booked are the same you get the same people that listen to the same music you get the same people that are attending the thing so it just ends up being loads of copycats of each other right everyone's wearing those funky shirts like there was a couple of festivals i saw over the weekend everyone was wearing fucking or a few months ago everyone's wearing those weird you know flowery pattern shirts with jean shorts and shit it's the same person with the same thing whereas i think that person if they just showed them maybe a little bit something they might be interested or they might not they might say you know fuck off i'll go listen to, i'll go stick with michael bibby but still give them the option to have the ability to hear that and to see it in context with the people that are actually playing the music who are about that culture dancing around it and then they can vibe with it i think that usually is the best way to go about those kind of things but again what do i know but it's just cool to see regardless um body movements again it's all sold out anyway so for sure they've been successful um the only thing that looks like it's available now are the after parties um you got you got the heron sauna that kind of um berlin collective they're doing one so that's going to be absolutely sick so if you're around definitely go and check that out if you want to do so but yeah body movements um happening tomorrow in london it looks like an absolutely barn summer of event i cannot wait I cannot wait for everybody that's going to be dressing up and having a great time and uploading all their little things onto their social medias and shit. So um, apart from that, uh, moving on, I won't talk about Serb October. So Serb October, obviously for me, is a great time because like I said, it's a far better time for me to kind of realign myself than um, dry January because I usually do that anyway without even thinking about it. But Serb October is sort of the thing that kind of interrupts your kind of going out schedule, especially now that we've kind of been able to kind of be out for the last, what, six months, it feels like, to then have a Serb to then have a sober month that you kind of have to just put the drink down, put down the spoons and the, and the keys and whatnot and just chill. It's a good thing because it allows you to kind of center yourself, get yourself realigned. And it also is a weird way in general, if you want to kind of remind yourself of how not dependent you are on the things that you kind of do when you go outdoors in a total have fun and for me personally being a bit of a night owl and liking you know liking dance music and loving that whole scene and community and traveling the world to go to different clubs it can sometimes be a little bit confusing as to why you're going out are you going out to be seen are you going out to hook up are you going out to get mashed up are you going out to just whatever to escape your reality whatever it may be but usually when it comes down to the core of it i just enjoy legitimately enjoy being around strangers and just dancing to loud 
you know electronic music that's basically it being able to just like flare your arms and just go absolutely crazy the momentum of everybody like i kind of find it i kind of relate it similar to like going to like your first crossfit classes right they can be a bit wanky but the reason why crossfit classes work is because everybody around you kind of pushes you to kind of do more than you'd probably do if you're doing uh, wood on your own and i've done them right i do i do kind of workouts a day on my own at my local gym i'm just going to crossfit.com and copy the workout and it's you know it's pretty baked that the intensity that i have in a in a kind of group will be different than the intensity that i have doing on my own in a mirror somewhere same thing goes for rave the amount of time i'm going to be able to spend on the dance floor without going to a toilet which is what i kind of do in terms of records i try and set myself little targets about okay i'm going to try and stay on this dance floor until like two hours and just like dance my face off before i go to a toilet before i go to a bar or whatever right and usually you're only able to do that or even push off to maybe two three hours four hours because the guy next to you is absolutely going off his face right i mean he's absolutely feeling everything you're hugging you're high-fiving it absolutely feels amazing right so that that's usually what I love about all that kind of thing. But again, it can get a bit, you know, you can lose yourself in the source as um, Gucci Man once famously said, and it's good to kind of realign yourself. And in general, I like to have the balance. I like to have the structure and the kind of routine of doing certain things Monday to Friday. And then of course, going out and playing and kind of playing hard when I need to on the weekend, if need be. So work hard, play hard, that kind of thing. And one of the things that I work hard on, something I've kind of loved to do over the years was reading. And I've been, you know, something I've been fortunate to kind of have in terms of um, an intrinsic desire to read. I've always kind of been a big reader, even when I was little. I'd always read comic books and encyclopedias and all this sort of stuff and Guinness Book Records and stuff, right? I'd be spending my time in the library, you know, just hanging around, reading shit, sometimes nicking books, you know, the usual stuff, right? Um, so it's, it, I was quite fortunate, even though I was a bad student when I kind of, you know, got a bit older and went into secondary school and college and uni, I wasn't the best student. I kind of, you know, took a, I kind of took liberties because I was, it, things came easy to me i still kept hold of the kind of um the desire to read and over the last few years i was kind of known for reading like set myself targets of reading like three books sometimes four or five books per month and a lot of people will be like oh my god man that's so that's extreme that's amazing how do you do that and it usually isn't anything that incredible really in my experience or from my point of view because what i did is i set myself these tiny targets of like making sure that i read an hour per day and when I was working in a normal office job commuting to work, it would made it really easy to kind of get through loads of books because think about it. If I'm saying myself a target of reading an hour per day, that means that's an hour that, that doesn't include my commute. It's just an hour. I have to kind of total up some way, shape or form. Then you add in my commute because usually if, it, if it's a sub-October or it, yeah, it's a sub-October month. If it's a sub-October month, then usually I'm, I've committed to like spending less time on my phone. So that kind of is out of the equation. So I'm spending an hour a day reading. I'm spending the time that I'll be commuting reading, the time I'll be waiting for the train reading, the time I'm waiting for the bus reading. Every time that I'll be on my phone, I'm spending it with a book. So that could easily add up to about two and a half, an hour and a half per day. So you times that, you know, throughout the entire week or entire month, and you could quite easily get through those books in a very, very quick time. Especially if you're reading a book that you really enjoy, you end up speeding through a book and trying to finish it as fast as you can so you can find out what the ending's like, innit? So that's what usually happened to me. So I could really get through loads of those books really, really quickly in those kind of four, five and a half, or five, four, you know, four and a half weeks, whatever it may be, that happened in a month. So that's what I'm going to do now for sub October. I've set myself a target of reading these books here that I recently purchased from Amazon. If you can see them there, can you see those books there? Hopefully you can. Yeah, those books there that I purchased from Amazon. If you can see my face, I'll put on the full of thumbnail. Uh, but yeah, so book number one that I've got reading through sub October is um, Stephen Fry's book Troy: Our Greatest Story Ever Told. He's got a couple of others based on um, you know uh, ancient Greece and mythologies and stuff. So I'm going to be enjoying this one to get through. I think I've got Mythos and Heroes actually somewhere. I've got Catherine Belton's uh, Putin's People: How the KGB Took Back Russia and Then Took the On the West. So I'm going to be reading that too. I'm going to enjoy that. I've got this Taolin uh leave society a novel which i think i saw being given out at some fashion show in new york i forgot which one it was um there's a fashion show outdoor somewhere and they left all these on the chair i just kind of saw it on instagram and thought you know what let me grab it and the, no idea what this book's about but i thought let me grab it and see what the vibe is um so let's see if fashion people actually read good books of his shit then i've got another book here called four thousand weeks time and how to use it by oliver berkman so that's going to be an interesting one to read as well in terms of how to utilize your time and all that good stuff and then the last one i've got a book called dead mountain um an untold true story of um die 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 love past incident by donnie eicher 
the reason why I got this is because there's a TV series out at the moment, a foreign language one, I think it's Russian made as well, uh, called Dead Mountain, basically, you know, uh, a TV series about this book. So I wanted to basically read the book first to see what the vibe is before I watch the series, just to kind of, you know, get an idea of what I'm reading, or what I'm watching actually. And, I, and I'm a big fan of kind of, you know, getting at the source material. Now, there's always the opportunity that I may not finish every single one, but the good thing about Sober October is that just by committing to reading an hour per day and spending less time on my phone and on the internet and doing other destructive things it's going to kind of recenter me it's going to obviously open my mind so it's going to allow me to learn new things improve my vocabulary maybe make me less anxious and in general help me to just kind of sort out and figure out my thoughts so that's what usually happens with books you read a book you, you don't really agree with the premise you start to kind of argue with the with the writer in your head you start to you kind of it starts it kind of sharpens your arguments it kind of makes you question your positions all those kind of good stuff i'm going to end up doing as i'm reading this book so i'm really really um and i really really anxious to kind of get started i've already started in a couple so it's going to be a great time to kind of be powering through these books throughout the majority of this month during sober october that's basically what i'm doing man i'm mostly going to be doing that and of course training running and shit i've got a list somewhere i've got to show anyway i'll show it later of what i'm actually doing for the sober october but yeah i'm looking forward to it man i'm looking forward to it okay that's it for now um let's move on from that one and let's do this news courtesy of the guardian it looks like the other football teams in the premier league are not very happy about newcastle's um saudi led takeover and they have complained basically and they're gonna kick up a fuss it feels like which makes sense considering that it's newcastle getting this sort of investment it's going to maybe create more disparity in the league and whatnot but hey I don't know how far they're going to be able to go with this, but we'll see. It says here, headline, angry Premier League clubs demand emergency meeting on Newcastle deal. Um, angry Premier League clubs target the Premier League with complaints about the Newcastle takeover and are pushing for an emergency meeting next week. The 19 other top flight clubs are understood to be united in opposition to the Saudi-led consortium being allowed to buy out Mike Ashley and are demanding to know what change, what change sorry, for it to be waived through and why they receive so little notice. The demand of the emergency meeting is not so much an attempt to derail the takeover because it's too late rather than reflection on how high feelings are, are running clubs have expressed concern that the premier league uh, brand could be damaged by the saudi arabia's uh, public investment fund the pif um taking 80 percent stake in newcastle um though eyebrows will be raised on, on this uh, as this is given at this given the identity of the other owners in the division true the deal has been fiercely criticized by human rights groups especially as the pif the state sovereign wealth fund is overseen by crown's prince mohammed bin salam who ironically enough was the one that's been accused of maybe being at the center of the murder of jamal khashoggi in it which is wild but i'm sure newcastle fans are going to be turning a blind eye to that one every time someone brings it up they'll be like look up the sky do, 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 do. Okay. <laughs> he says yeah, the arrival of the new uh set of billionaire owners is bound to upset some clubs who see on the horizon a far more competitive newcastle and the prospects of same james park wealth inflating transfer fees and wages the league's chief executive, Richard Masters, and chairman Gary Hoffman have received complaints from clubs who had no idea the Newcastle takeover was about to have you approved. It was first proposed in March 2020, but a consortium withdrew its bid four months later amid growing fears that it would fail the Premier League's owners' directors' test. The subject was not on this agenda. The recent club holders' share meeting two weeks ago, or oh, they blindsided them, didn't they? Listen, they blindsided them. The league effectively blocked the deal last year, and it said that last week at a completion, sorry, a competition appeals tribunal involving Ashley and the league that the arbitration proceedings to decide the matter were scheduled to begin on the 3rd of January. It's understood the clubs learned via the media on Wednesday of the impending takeover and received confirmation from the league by email at 5.18 on the Thursday. That is the time at which the league released a statement saying the deal had done and that it had received legally binding assurance that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia would not control Newcastle. The... The league will no doubt point out the issues of the what's that Conf confidentiality legally prevented the sharing of the Newcastle developments. Furthermore, the league's board nominated powers over the owners and directors test were endorsed after the vote among the clubs. The league's QC, Adam Lewis, said that the cat. Da, 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 da. But yeah, you know the deal, isn't it? So the other clubs are upset. It makes complete sense. They were kind of blindsided, it feels like, by the league. They didn't want to obviously bring it up before in the shareholders meeting because they didn't want them to have any opposition to it. But unfortunately, the the Premier League is such a lucrative industry to get involved, especially if you've kind of got the money that those kind of guys have got, especially the, the clubs that are sort of like sleeping giants like Newcastle is. If you can inject the right amount of money, put the 
right structures in place and hire sorry, the right people in the right positions, you could effectively double and triple your money within a few years very, very, very quickly. And that is super tempting and too tantalizing for a lot of these big money men because after a while, especially if you're if you especially if you're at that level of wealth, you've probably invested in just about everything. You've got your fingers in every single pie. There's not a lot you can there's not a lot you haven't done with your money. And if you really want to kind of again, the gamification of it is cool too, because you get interested in football, you start to actually get um you start to actually get some buy-in with the club and the local community. You want to put smiles on faces. You want to create memories. All those things kind of last forever. And if, again, if they said, um, if it's been said, you know, shiny skyscrapers and massive mansions are like um, a kind of a dude's way to kind of memorialize yourself, right? It's sort of like a modern version of a Roman sculpture, right? Uh, this idea, you've got this amazing, like high rising building somewhere. People are like, oh, whose building's that? Oh, that is um, Arthur D. Russell, da, 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 da. That's a way of people kind of remembering you throughout the ages. So you kind of, your memory lasts forever. So you're essentially immortal. What a better way to be immortal than by creating memorable, unforgettable moments for football fans who are then going to pass that on to generations and generations to come, right? We're still watching football clips from the flipping 70s 80s 90s um early 2000s that people created from yesteryears that are still inspiring people nowadays to do the things that they want to do so imagine now if you're somebody for the from these kind of families that wants to create you know new memories and maybe a lost legacy for your family this would be a great way to go about it so i get the need to do it i also understand the other club's resistance to having these people in here but i just think that that's that 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 kind of boat has sailed it's too late now there is not going to be any turnaround in terms of getting us back into a sort of sensible place that ship has sailed a long long time ago and it kind of is what it is really unfortunately you know what i mean not what you can do here then next i wanted to quickly talk about this clip that i saw actually it was quite funny um and quite worrying at the same time but also maybe just an interesting sort of reflection on what's going on in the world at the moment again i'm not in america i don't know much about american politics i don't know much about uk politics and i don't care about politics in general but it is quite interesting to see the lack of kind of coverage and the lack of concern that parts of the mainstream media have with joe biden's quite, quite clear um mental degradation in some way shape or form right he's clearly struggling in some way shape or form yes i know he's always had a bit of a stutter like i do he rushes his words he kind of forgets where he is i get it but he's clearly looking like he's struggling he's clearly looking like they've dosed him up with however much he to dose him up to kind of get him able to kind of go out and give these speeches but in general he doesn't look good he doesn't sound great either especially considering if you remember who, the, who joe biden was when um he was obviously um Figamajiggy, when he was uh, Barack Obama's vice president, right? It's a completely different person. He's not as sprightly. Of course, time has moved on. I understand they get older, but he's not as sprightly. He's not as quick-witted. He just looks a complete shell of a man that he was prior. And this is a good example of it. A little kind of uh, clip that someone put together here on YouTube um, called 800. It's called 80 Million Votes. And it's basically Joe Biden looking less than or looking and sounding less than great. And it's just sad to see, to be completely honest. Let's play the clip. You know... Uh, and uh, with, uh, and uh, and I know, uh, and I, I, I look, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> not a joke, folks, not a joke, not a joke as well. Tim, where's Tim? Uh, and uh, and Robert Reiter, Reader, Reader, R E I T E R, Reader. When you see headlines and reports of mass firings and hundreds of people losing their jobs, look at the bigger story. And for folks who haven't gotten vaccinated, get it done. And last night I was on the television. On television, I was on the telephone. Jesus. Make sure the television. The, excuse me. Make sure you have the record player on at night. The, 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 the phone. Make sure the kids hear words. Bruh. Yeah, man, I don't know. It's just sad, isn't it? And I guess, if anything, it's a more of a f bad reflection on Trump, really, really. I, mean, I think so, I'd say, especially his fans and supporters, that Trump couldn't defeat somebody. Again, he had, he had his, the car stacked against him. There was obviously some... Co con some kind of co um, collective effort to make sure that he didn't get a second term which again understandable because he was an incredibly unlikable character just in general as a human being and he wasn't the, the person he wasn't he wasn't an easy person to kind of root for even if you were like an ardent republican out there i definitely understand why you had to you had a really come home to you had a come to jesus moment where you had to kind of realize well, i really want this guy to have a second term and kind of empower him because imagine how much how big of a beast he would have been second term he was already unbearable first term wise right in terms of having that 
wind up his sails and you know i am the present 40 um what's it uh, 45th is it 45th at the time but it's a sad indictment on trump that he wasn't able to beat someone like a biden given all his you know men given his mental handicaps or his mental he's a uh, comprehension disadvantages at the moment um whatever it may be but it's also um shows the desperation that uh, the american citizens had where they just couldn't put up with having or even imagining the prospect of giving trump another four years they just couldn't do it and they would have voted for anybody it didn't matter who exactly it was but biden was basically the best of a bad bunch do you know what i mean um he was the safest option in that regard but man you look at it and you see him and you see how he's obviously deteriorating in front of everybody's eyes and the fact that everyone kind of ignores it and doesn't really want to talk about it because again it's joe biden and you know most of the mainstream media are mostly left-leaning so they don't want to speak ill of their guy but if this was on the other side imagine if this was trump the amount of flipping dissections that would be done the amount of flipping op-eds the amount of panel discussions talking about what's wrong with him what he did this like it would be insane right do you remember they used to zoom in on trump's hair when it was blowing in the wind and shit and make it kind of embarrassing him that way imagine if he was slurring his words not knowing where he was you know mistaking a telephone for a television like come on man Oh, like people would be losing their minds. You know what I mean, I think you know. He, I think he mistake a television for a telephone. Either way, they both begin with a T, and he fucked them up completely. So Joe Biden's not looking in great shape. He's obviously looking like he's struggling in some way, shape, or form. But I don't know, man. I guess it is, is what it is. This is the place we're in at the moment. Most world leaders, for the most part, aren't necessarily the most um, uh, what do you say? polished or well put together people you've ever seen from new zealand to canada to the uk to brazil to the philippines everyone's got some you know everyone's got kind of broken leaders you know what i mean which is which i think is a good thing as well in the in a weird way because what it does it does kind of remind you that these people can't really do much for you. Do you know what I mean? If whoever it is, whoever there's somebody that you want to vote for, somebody that represents your party, represents your ideals, or stands for the things that you believe in, there's not much that they can actually do for you day to day that's going to actually improve your life. Not really, in the, in the grand scheme of things. You kind of have to take, um, um, what you call it? You kind of have to take... Um, responsibility for your own life and look after your friends family and those people close to you and just keep it moving really that's all you can do you can't really wait for these guys to kind of quote unquote save you do you know what i mean and because you know he's just about trying to save himself do you know what i mean just imagine what his family are feeling like at the moment they must feel conflicted he's obviously got this the big seat the big job but essentially they're losing their grandfather they're losing their dad they're losing their brother their family member in public at a quicker rate because he's having to kind of be put in front of the camera he's having to be put in front of people so he's obviously going to deteriorate at a far at a far faster rate than he would have done if he was able to kind of go away somewhere sit in a low cabin and be kind of waited on hand and foot he's what you know he's on planes he's on coaches he's running around in cars like he's obviously doing stuff that you shouldn't do if you're obviously in the state that he's in which i assume he's in again who knows if this is true but regardless you know he's not looking too tight is he he's bloody not looking too tight and talking about people that are looking too tight and probably struggling and probably thinking, what the fuck happened to my life? Free Pooh Shiesty. Free Big Burr. Free him, man. Because what an absolutely nutty story that Pooh Shiesty is now um, facing life in prison um, with a trial that's due to coming up really, really soon, right? Especially when you consider that he just blew up as in what six no, a year ago maybe 18 months ago he was kind of the next big thing you know obviously gucci main signed him he's going to be the next breakout star in his um new label that he was starting and then all of a sudden bang it kind of got pulled on if the rug got pulled on him and now he's in a situation where he's, he's legitimately facing life in prison again he can only be blamed for it because he essentially put himself in this position but it's such a gnarly ride to be on isn't it to kind of be seeing the heights of the heights, you know, seeing all this money coming in, all this notoriety, and then suddenly you're in a flipping steel cage somewhere. Do you know what I mean? With with some of the most dangerous people <laughs> on that walk in the face of this earth. It's just flipping wild to see. But the headline reads as follows. Pooh Shiesty withdraws request to delay trial in federal armed robbery case. It says um, rapper Pooh Shiesty has reversed the course and is no longer wants a delay um, of his October 25th trial on charges. He shot a man in the buttocks during an alleged Florida robbery involving a rent, uh, rented bright green McLaren, high end sneakers, marijuana, and liquid codeine. Mate, that video, have you seen the video? The video is available, it's a CCTV video, and it allegedly shows Pooh Shiesty and his boys meeting up with these guys who they're going to buy trainers from. And I don't know why. I'm assuming they always had the intention of robbing these guys, but 
you know, online and on Instagram, especially there are these kids who basically act as the kind of go-between for these rappers to purchase like really expensive, cool shit, like clothes and trainers and whatnot. Some of them are really cool. Um, they're like 16 year old kids who, have, who are making flipping hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds, you know, helping out rappers, helping out celebrities to get hold of shoes that they can't get a hold of. But others are obviously guys from the, from the streets who are kind of using it as another opportunity to kind of, you know, fun, wash their money, quote unquote, right? To kind of do something a little bit more legal. So I don't know if those guys were on the street side of things or if they were just kind of regular dudes, but judging by the car they pulled up in, judging by, the, again, the video, there's no audio to it, judging by how they carried themselves, they just seemed like regular dudes just selling some shoes. But for whatever reason, they both pull up into this into this kind of car park area, the Lamborghini, the McLaren, and obviously there's a Mercedes, I think it's a BMW, the guys, the kids are in selling the shoes. They get out the cars, they're showing the trainers, they're kind of, you know, expecting their wares in the cars. What you'd expect to see like a trade look like if you're outdoors, you know, trainers on the bonnet, some clothes hanging on the door, and then out of nowhere, it just changes in a second. People are getting shot. People are running into cars, driving off. And then by, you know, within a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds, one McLaren leaves, the BMW stood there, and there's a flipping Louis Vuitton bum bag there on the floor that obviously contained 30,000 pounds or something, right? Which is insane. Many of you found that. You would have been gut Obviously, you would have been seen on camera. People would have actually found you, but still. It just kind of switched so, so quickly straight away. And again, this is when Pusha actually is a celebrity. He's well known. Um, he has a very distinctive look, a very distinctive walk. And it's just like, why are you doing that, brother? Especially if you're, if, even if you're going to do that, allow your goons to do that. Why are you the one front and centre, you know, allegedly carrying a strap? It, it is what it is. But it continues. The Memphis, um, the native, the Memphis native who's back in blood collaboration with Little Dirk when Platinum in May had petitioned the court for a delay last week, arguing that he needed until December the 6th to property to properly prove his defense against the claims he was part of an armed drug trafficking conspiracy dating back in 2019. Prosecutors said they were fine with the delay, but that conflicts would push. Sorry about that. Conflicts would push the trial into the February. The feds also told the court that they are reviewing new allegations and potential suspense, uh, soup, sus. Sub subsiding, how's that word called? But potentially suppers superseding. Um, why can't I say that word? Superseding, yeah, superseding indictment. Wherever, let's continue. Um, my word, my mouth is going mad. In a new um, Monday filing, lawyers representing the rapper and his two co-defendants said the trio now believes it's in their best interest to proceed to trial in three weeks, even in light of the voluminous discovery. Um, the 21-year-old rapper born Lontrell Williams has pleaded not guilty to four counts of federal indictment carrying a, carrying a possible maximum sentence of life in prison. Prosecutors claim that he and the co-defenders Bobby Brown, 21, and Jaden DeRosa, 21, robbed and shot two victims during a confrontation at the London Hotel in Bay Harbor Island in October 9th, 2020. Williams alleged drove the McLaren to the hotel to purchase the high-end athletic sneakers and marijuana and also was hoping to negotiate an extension to his vehicle rental as part of the transaction. A probable cause affidavit signed by the FBI agent state. Oh, so they were trying to, so that McLaren was owned by those kids too. Mad, isn't it? The feds claimed the video surveillance shows Williams pulling up to the hotel with Brown, described as his road manager, riding shotgun. The Rosa behind the wheel of the black Mercedes big back. Mate, imagine someone's road manager also being your guy from the roads who's actually going to be able to buck up with you, pull up and just put it on people straight away. That's why you got to be careful with these guys, man, because the, the people they have on their team are just guys that they legitimately grew up with in the trenches. You know what I mean, like not guys to be messed about with. Um, one man approached Williams and, and handed him a bag of weed while the second man handed um, Williams a sports bag the affidavit states Williams allegedly pulled out a, pulled a pair of sneakers out of the shopping bag and started examining them while the second man walked around and climbed into the passenger seat vacated by Brown as the second man held one of the sneakers in his hand Williams pointed at Draco's a uh, Draco um, subcompact weapon at him and demanded that he leave the sneakers in the car <laughs> holy shit that's some gangster shit Dorosa then stepped out of the Maybach approached the second man and attempted to rob him with his jewelry prosecutor's claim when the man attempted to stop Dorosa Williams allegedly shot the man in the buttocks oh my god moments later Brown allegedly shot the first man in the hip causing him to fall to the ground Williams allegedly brandished his Draco and said words to the effect of don't you try it the affidavit says as Williams drove off a Louis Vuitton bag stuffed with 40,000 $912 in cash fell out of the driver's seat. The McCarran authorities claim investigators linked the cash to Williams by matching the full serial numbers of one of the recovered bills to a $100 bill flashing on Instagram's Instagram. Oh, no. Days before the alleged robbery. Telling on yourself, man. These Insta again, these money phones things are just, oh, man. Williams' public Instagram account also features photos of him showing off um, the green McLaren and displaying several long rifles and a plethora of $100 bills the agent wrote. 
Damn. In a separate incident described in the affidavit, Williams allegedly pulled a black semi-automatic pistol from his waistband and waved it around the King of Diamond. Yeah, that's what I remember I saw. Remember that one? There's a video of Pooh Shiesty in some club. I guess it's a strip club performing. Looking amazing. He's got like a banner carver on a tiny polo, skinny jeans and white jeans and white shoes, right? He looks sick. It's all, you know, he's flipping, dripping diamonds all over the place. And for whatever reason, he's got money stuffed all over him. I think he's even got some in his, like, like in his shirt. Like he's just looking like an absolute, you know, like absolute G. He's got it more in his pockets and shit. And I think somehow him performing with all the money stacked all over him, something dropped out of his pocket. And someone obviously picked it and run. And obviously he didn't notice until later. Then by the time he noticed, he kind of got angry. It's like me mugging the crowd. And I guess pulled out a gun and kind of like, you know, showing people like, hey, if you've got that shit, I'm going to shoot you. Allegedly. Um, it continues, uh, the, the incident, the, 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 the King of Diamonds Club in Miami last May after he dropped some cash on the ground, pur uh, purportedly worried patrons might grab it. As security tried to remove him from the building, he allegedly sh fired a shot, striking the security guard in the angle. So you're trying to help him out, right, Nianko? You're trying to help him out, trying to get him out of this place before the, the crowd turns rowdy because it's just one dude. Yes, Pistrasti is real and he's from the streets, cool, but you're not going to kill everybody, do you know what I mean? If people want to rush you and just strip you of all your money and all your drawers and all your clothes, they could. So security guard trying to do good by him trying to get him out and then bang he shoots him in the ankle like much thanks you get in it in subsequent filings Williams and his lawyers challenged this indictment claiming that there couldn't be possibly be enough evidence to support the count claim he opened fire on the McLaren a judge responded with an order saying the victim positively identified Williams as a shooter oh no they're telling as well see that's him done Ben I don't know how he's going to get out if he does get out of this then big up man but this is looking like a signed seal deliver case um, a judge responded with the order saying the victim positively ID'd um, Williams which is obviously Pusheisty as a shooter and a photograph of the nearby vehicle showed a dent allegedly caused by a bullet shot from Williams pissed, uh, position the judge also ruling said the man shot in the buttock allegedly handed Williams a bag of liquid codeine before he got into the car a source close to Williams tells Rolling Stone the man was trying to push drugs on the rapper in an unsisted way Williams also claims the two alleged victims were armed during the ah so he's actually trying to claim that it was self-defense and they were trying to frame him or something Williams also held has been held in custody since early July. He faces a possible life sentence if convicted of the most serious count of superseding indictment, discharging the firearm and, and, and in furtherance of a crime of violence. Now, most likely, he'll maybe, there might be a plea deal. No, they're going to trial, so there is no plea. Whatever plea that we might have got offered has already been offered, I assume, right? That's how American law works. So more likely than not, I don't think he's going to get life in prison. He'll probably end up getting double digits though, which will effectively... <sighs> Where did he end his career? How old is he? Is he 21? Or is he, how old is he? The 21 year old, right? If he gets double digits and he comes out when he's 31, will anyone really care? Because part of the reason why he's so popular and so um, loved at the moment is because he's young, he's good looking, handsome dude, right? He's obviously, you know, real as they say, quote unquote. So if you come out when you're 31 and there's new people coming out of the scene nowadays, will people still care about you? I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm not really too sure if they will. But regardless, free Poo Shiesty. I'm a big fan. I like his records, like his albums. I still think that feature that he has on Gucci Mane's album called, where is it? Let me see if I can get it here. It's Gucci Mane's album. It's one of my favorite tracks that I always play in the gym. If ever I want to get like a really aggressive pump on. Let me see if I can find here. A, B, C, D, G, Gucci Mane, I Study. Yeah, Gucci Mane's I Study album. There's a track on here called... Yeah, that's the one. I've actually got it. Pause on it. See, look, there you go. I've actually played it there. It's called um, Like 34 and 8, and it's featuring Pooh Shaishi. It's probably got one of his best verses ever. Hey, what's it? Woo! That line actually is mad, isn't it? I got four niggas <laughs> diss me. That got the, that diss me the song that got the house flamed up. It's like, God damn it. And now there's a leak came out. No, there's a, actually a, a prison recording that Mick Mill, I think, put out of him talking absolute crud on the phone as well. So it's like, God, man, these guys, man, they're just, they're just from a, di they just cut a different way in it. There's no way you're going to silence him. You're going to, you're going to simmer his gangster no matter how much time he's facing in prison. He's just going to be the guy that he is in this. So I guess you've got to love it or hate it. But yeah, free poo shiesty. Hopefully he busts case, but it's looking like a science and delivered one if he's able to bounce from this then he needs you know he needs some better guidance around this so people don't you know take the piss but hey what can you do moving on moving on moving on next on list we've got this wild news courtesy of variety about Lindsay lohan inking a deal for her first podcast promising an intimate conversation with friends and guests like who the 
fuck needs a Lindsay Lohan podcast? This is like equivalent to people. Remember people were getting angry or some Joe Rogan fans were getting pissed off that Joe Rogan would keep suggesting to all these guests that they should start a podcast regardless of how boring the guest was on his show. It's like, no, why would you suggest that to somebody? Like, that's actually a terrible idea. And if guests would go ahead and go do it, they'll record five episodes and then kind of, you know, never be seen again. But obviously nowadays with the proliferation of podcasts and how successful they've been coming, it's quite a good way to kind of produce content like, it's sort of like a low barrier of entry, of course, especially if you're doing one that's not got any video, just recording audio into like a Zoom mic or something. Um, it's it's pretty easy to do. And uh, kind of um, the profit margins involved in partnerships and whatever it may be called, marketing sponsors and shit is super high. So you could effectively be raking in millions by just recording a very niche and very specific, very well-liked and well-followed podcast as I am actually. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But yeah, but you know what I mean, right? So if you're somebody like that's got some notoriety behind you, you're Lindsay Lohan and you've got some stories to tell, you've obviously lived a very colourful life, then maybe people want to tune in. But again, with somebody like a Lindsay Lohan, how 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 long can you sit there and listen to her kind of, you know, Hollywood coked up stories before it gets boring? There's only so many of the stories that are going to be interesting before you kind of get like, eh. And again, if it's going to be guest led too, there's only so many guests out there. Most of those podcasts, I have guests on there all the time. They get a little bit boring. They get a little bit stale after a period of time, especially if you run out of guests to kind of go in that interview. And there usually does happen. It usually comes a point where there's not enough interesting people doing interesting new things that you want to interview again and again so you have to go then back into the you know the archives of people that worked before recycle rinse and repeat the audience gets bored they move on to other things bloody blah, blah blah you know the complete story but again if you're a celebrity like Lindsay lohan and you're very famous and again act actress wise i don't know if she's you know really got back on the on the on the on the saddle that much when it comes to acting whether or not she actually cares about that because if i'm not mistaken the last thing i heard about Lindsay lohan is that she was um did she co-found or open some sort of like bar in greece or something like that right i don't know something like that she was doing some sort of um hospitality thing out there for a bit and that looked that looked pretty amazing and pretty cool to see you know kind of venturing out pivoting to something more kind of outside of a sort of range or something that you wouldn't really expect her to do to do this seems a bit tired seems a bit late seems a bit old but again if she's got a deal and she's got some money and people are willing to kind of give her all the equipment all the resources needed to just to kind of rock up record and just chat shit into a microphone then why not so the following Lindsay Lohan will get behind the mic to host her first podcast in a deal with digital content studio studio 71 on a yet identified so on the yet untitled interview podcast the actor singer and entrepreneur will share singer what's a Lindsay Lohan song have you heard one nah mate not a singer will share her authentic voice and never before seen side studio 71 tease there's no release date for the show which is tentatively set to premiere late 2021 or early 2022 it says yeah, I'm excited to partner with studio 21 in development and production of my podcast long said in statement I'm looking forward to connecting with more of my fans and having an intimate conversation with friends thought leaders across the industries why would thought leaders want to sit down with Lindsay Lohan like for real like some of these people are just if anything, it's probably better just interview your friends or interview other kind of washed up kind of actors and stuff and sort of get their perspective on what it is to kind of navigate your career after you had like a real big pop when you were younger and you were a child star and then you kind of fell in hard times. That'd be a better angle to go about as opposed to what? Interviewing what? Uh, N head of NGOs and corporations and what else? Like fucking, um, she's probably going to she's probably going to interview that girl, isn't it? Who's that environmentalist girl, that little 15 year old, whatever she's name is, the one that goes on trains everywhere? She's probably going to interview someone like that, right? It's just going to be a madness, but you know, more power to her, I guess. Lohan, whose credits include Mean Girls and The Parent Trap, the, those are credits, those are old credits. So it, it's set to start in a Netflix holiday rom com movie. Lohan's podcast will join Studio 71's woman hosted shows, which include Worst Frest with Brittany Furlan, Unsolicited Advice with comedians Ashley Nicole and Tyan Rene, Ratchet and Respectable with Dem what's that? Demetria L. Lucas, and Listen Honey with Janina Gen Gen May. Is that, um, is that Finger Majiggy's uh, wife? Um, what's his name? You know the rapper. What's his fucking name, man? Young Jeezy. Is that Jeezy's wife, right? Ginny May? Those line up of podcasts, I couldn't think of more things that would make me want to jump off a building somewhere. Those names and those people, like, oh, God, the vocal fry, the stories, the, you know, the just incessant boringness of it. It's just like, God. According to Studio 71, 75% of listeners of the shows in his podcast network are between the ages of 18 and 34, and 55% are female, which is pretty good for a podcast part, because I think most podcasts, what? that women listen to that are really popular, usually those um, 
serial killer ones right um so it's good to kind of see something a little bit more different that way also stuart theory one's podcast are available for free with ads on platforms including apple Podcasts, and spotify it says we are thrilled to welcome Lindsay lohan to studio 71's podcast network we can't wait for her to take her listeners behind the scenes on her life and and work the maury smith said maury said maria smith senior talent relations manager for podcast 71 with her unparalleled experience as an entre- entertainer and entrepreneur we're excited to the da, 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 da. I wonder how much it's going to be, man, her deal. How much did she get paid, do you think, contract-wise? How long is it, did she say? Uh, the, the, they didn't say how long the deal is going to be or anything. No real details, but I wonder how long they're going to... Um, I wonder how long the deal is, if it's like a four, five, six, seven-year deal, or if it's something that they're just going to do for a, you know, for a short period, see if it runs, and then kind of go from there. But either way... I'm excited. I'm excited. Um, what else am I going to check today? Oh, yeah, let's check this, actually. I want to check this because I think this is actually good to kind of comment on quickly. Bear with me one secundo. Let's see if I can get it up on here. Bloody blah, 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 body, blah, blah, boom, 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 boom. Get rid of that. Come on, come on. Load, load, load. It's going to load. It's going to load in time. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Bear with me a second. Let's see if I can get this up here. Because I want to talk about it before I move on to the other topics that I wanted to speak about. I want to quickly get on top of this. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, That's another thing I need to do too. Once I get all my stuff settled down, I need to flip and get this um, MacBook Pro that I've got up there fixed. It's actually a really good one. It's from like, well, it's a good one for me. It's 2015. The ones with the CD drive in it. I just want to replace the CD. No, replace the solid, replace the hard drive with like a solid state hard drive. Um, and that's going to maybe make it run a bit better and obviously up the RAM a bit, a little bit, but that laptop was bulletproof, man. I loved it for working and whatnot. And it was obviously better for the podcast too, because it's a little bit more robust as opposed to using this MacBook Pro that I've got. Don't get me wrong, I'm not, you know, I'm taking a MacBook, MacBook Pro for granted, but I'd much prefer to have, um, MacBook Air, sorry, for granted. I'd much prefer to have the, um, MacBook Pro to use for the podcast because it's a little bit more, a little bit more sturdy. It can handle more things, especially stuff I got like Photoshop and all that stuff and GarageBand and iMovie and all the other stuff that I use and Rekordbox and Serato. Having the MacBook Pro is the best way to go about this doing this, you know what I mean? The best way. So let's get this up and loaded. Um, what's it? Oh yeah, I also watched um, Dave Chappelle's flipping stand-up comedy special um, called The Closer. It's absolutely incredible. Like probably, in my opinion, maybe his best so far. Maybe not his best overall, again, because it's not really a laugh a minute kind of thing because he's obviously moved on from that sort of vibe. But if you're, if whatever this new iteration of Dave Chappelle is this kind of half TED talk, half kind of, um, yeah, half TED talk, half comedy special sort of thing, this was the best representation I think of it so far. I absolutely loved it. Um, So much pain, so much kind of confusion, so much insight, so much wonder, so much offensive shit as well that really kind of caught people off guard. I think people are really surprised of how flipping offensive it was overall. But I absolutely loved it as a as a flipping um sorry as a um, as a as a comedy special. Definitely one of my favorites. And there's a really funny article here that somebody shared from the Hollywood Reporter that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But the actual special itself was really funny. He's watching the crowd's reaction because it didn't feel like. Maybe they cut it really well, but usually some stand-up specials, when they film it, they or when the comedian films it, they film maybe four sets, and then they use the best of the four sets and kind of splice them together. But with this one, it kind of felt like it was just one set they kind of filmed um, because the crowd didn't change that much as opposed to um, some other Dave Chappelle's um, comedy specials. But it was funny to see the people in the crowd reacting to some of the things facially, like, you know, not knowing what to say and do because he kind of started the the, the comedy special again. No spoilers, you know, it's out now. But um, he st- basically started saying, this is going to be my last. I'm basically going to light a match and burn, you know, and kind of, you know, light this whole house on fire, walk away. And this is going it, to, it's going to be what it's going to be. I think he knew fully well the content he was speaking about, the topics he was speaking about and how he was speaking about them, he was definitely going to incur the wrath of people online who are going to say he's cancelled because he's transphobic, homophobic and all these other things that people kind of label at him, even though he's just a comedian telling jokes and even though he's just kind of, you know, essentially asking rhetorical question on stage. So I thought that was fairly interesting, but just seeing the people's faces in the crowds, honestly, I'm going to get a picture up here because I kind of did a little uh, tweet for thing about it where I was kind of talking about the entire thing and how funny and hilarious it was, right? Um, so essentially, um, 
let me see let me see if i can get up here i got up on here it's definitely go here we go this is flipping legitimately one of the best things i've legitimately seen in a very very long time in terms of a stand-up special so um it starts off obviously i've got this picture that i shared on my um on my twitter where i took a screen grab of this so there's a crowd obviously watching um dave Chappelle work his magic and do his thing and then there's these two white ladies here who obviously, you know, with the coloured hair and the bright lipstick and stuff, you know, you, you, you could imagine what their political leanings are and hear what he's talking about. And it's just funny to see like the lady on the left is grinning ear to ear because she finds it funny. She can't help but laugh. But then her friend on the right or no, her friend on, the, on her left is obviously not laughing, doesn't find it funny whatsoever. It's really offensive to her. It's really caught off guard. And they're right bang in the middle of Dave Chappelle's eyesight, right? So he knows they're there. He knows when he's telling these jokes of when, what's coming, who's going to be upset of what and it's just funny to see that two those two reactions and also just the kind of idea of like did the lady on the left not tell her friend on the right that she was gonna go to a Dave Chappelle comedy special um you know taping were they not aware of how offensive it could potentially get or were they just blindsided because this was Dave Chappelle's last kind of I think contract obligation with Netflix and they didn't actually know how bad it was actually going to be who actually knows who bloody knows but I thought that scene was pretty funny to see and then there was this bit where Dave Chappelle says something that upset the both of them. They, they didn't find it funny whatsoever. And I think this might have been um, something about a trans person's anatomy. I think if you watched it, you know what I mean. And it's just funny to see the guy at the back, <laughs> his face with it. This guy here, his face with it, right? And then he contrasts it with these two ladies. And even this black lady here, like, just like, um, I'm going to be like, I'm not just sure if I should be laughing at that. But that, that joke was legitimately one of the funniest things I've heard. Legitimately one of maybe the offensive things I've heard too, especially from somebody as big as Dave Chappelle because that's the thing with him too that's really cool as much as I think I would listen to Schultz's um, reaction to it he wasn't that impressed with the special but in terms of fans of comedy of stand-up comedy in general obviously I'm a fan of stand-up comedy I obviously listen to guys at like Legion of Skanks and a few other people they're quite they're lower level guys right they're not as famous right so they can take more chances because there's nothing really to cancel with those kind of guys because they're self-sufficient they're lower level they're not that famous you're not going to take much away from them if you try and cancel them right seth simons and all those guys try it but it's a bit of a waste of time like those jake flores guys you know what i mean they're trying to always kind of stir up controversy but no one really cares because these guys aren't that well known but it's something else for a guy of Dave Chappelle's notoriety, right? He's like on the same level as like a Bill Burr, of like a John Mulaney, of like a Sebastian Maniscalco, even like a Joe Rogan, right? In terms of like well-known comedians, like comedians that kind of supersede stand-up comedy and just kind of are like a fixture of the entertainment industry. For him to go up on stage and say the stuff that he says is just so amazing and really courageous and also something to be quite, com to be com it's commendable. In the same way that I was saying, remember when Akon was saying that wild shit about R. Kelly? I was like, oh, that's nuts, isn't it? Imagine dying on the R. Kelly hill. But on the other side of things, I think to myself, if you had fuck you money, part of the reason why fuck you money is so appealing to guys like myself who have a burning desire to share all my opinions and to say things exactly how I feel them in my head without kind of filtering myself is because you don't want to ever be like tied down by the man. You don't ever want someone to tell you what you can't say where you can't go if you can go on lunch if you can go on holiday can you go to toilet like you don't want someone to be in charge of you, you want to be free to kind of be the kind of driver of your own destiny right to kind of be able to take your family and friends with you and say hey we're going over there do you know what I mean? without somebody telling you no you can't go there you can't do this do you, know I mean? you want to be in charge of your own shit so when you when i think of the idea of fuck you money it's not just be ability to kind of live where you want to buy what you want and to not worry about ever looking at a bill again it's more so just about being able to just say what the fuck you want unfiltered because no one can counsel you because you are the master of your own ship you are the yeah you're a captain of your own ship no one can take anything away from you because you're so completely self-sufficient and also you have the ability or you have the also bonus what Dave Chappelle has you have an ardent fan base who are ride or die with you regardless they don't care what people say about you they're always going to be your fans and that is something that's so priceless same thing with people that have loads of supporters on like their Patreon or people that support their YouTube or whatever it may be it's great to know that you can take some chances because your fans are always going to be there for you you, even if the corporation decide oh this is too risky i don't want to upset the work mob and all that stuff so it's great to see somebody of his position do that sort of stuff but it is quite upsetting to see people in a crowd react the way they're reacting because it feels like when people say jokes on stage there are some people who interpret those jokes as like statements or rallying cries like go and kill all the trans go and kill all the gays when they're not saying that they're just, they're kind of showing jokes and i think at this point in time we're at in the moment it's really upsetting that you which is what dave Chappelle talks about that you can't be 
funny and take the piss out of everybody. Some people have to be treated with kid gloves. Some people are allowed to get ripped up, ripped to completely. Like, look at America as a good example. If you're not vaccinated, people are allowed to call you whatever you want, right? Call you a hit, call you dumb, uninformed, you know, um, bottom of the earth, blah, blah, blah. But then if you are vaccinated, no one's allowed to question your, you know, your meant your kind of flipping IQ and all that malarkey and say if you're smooth brained or not. It's only the people that are non vaccinated. That's that's thing. I, that's a thing I don't really like. I think everybody should be able to get the jokes, whether you're male, female, whatever sexual orientation you are, you know, able bodied, not able bodied, whatever. We all get the jokes, so that, that puts us all on the same playing field. We're all the same. We're on the same level. But if you start saying those people are up here, you're up, you're down there, it then starts to kind of separate us even more. And I think that's a sad thing when people go to comedy shows. I don't know what it is they kind of maybe it's because people are laughing and sometimes if people are laughing at stuff that you're kind of sensitive about it's the same with somebody said a joke about a flipping school shooting and you had a staff i remember that died in the school shooting of course that's going to hit you a little bit more but the person isn't trying to be offensive to make you upset they're trying to be offensive in order to find a line of where it kind of goes from funny to not funny because how else are you going to figure out what's funny if you can't kind of approach the line or step over it from time to time so that's the thing i was, I was a bit but again laughing at them in one way but i was quite bummed out to see them be so like pissed off and upset in terms of their face obviously i wasn't saying that in the tweet but you know what i mean in it right and then of course there's these lovely pictures at the end of the dave Chappelle special where he's got these great pictures r.i.p um, norm mcdonald uh norm um, Norm McDonald, no, sorry, RIP Norm is always got a great picture with Norm. He says, I think it's for Norm at the end. He's got great pictures with like Kanye West before in the change room, pictures of him hanging around, all black and white, really well done. I like the idea, or I like what he's done with his art and his kind of um, creativity, where he's been able to kind of present himself as more than just a stand up or make it more of like a musician. I don't know, it's just it's cool to see him have these sort of like things. I'm assuming there's going to be a hard physical copy of this um album or maybe of the whole series that he's done with netflix so there'll be probably pictures that you can have as well yourself so you can kind of see what it, it went into the specials the vibe around it and it's just nice to see this is obviously dave Chappelle here with his wife just chilling having a great time and then of course in response to that everyone kind of lost their mind because there's some really offensive jokes in that special and this is a headline from the Hollywood reporter it said dave Chappelle gets standing innovation amid netflix special controversy he said this is what being cancelled is i love it so i guess he kind of did a show after the special came out and after the controversy about him kind of saying the things he said he said, amid a swell of controversy around the new um, Netflix special, The Closer, Dave Chappelle took center stage Thursday as a, what's that? Sorry, why is it not letting me do it? Yeah, took center stage Thursday night at a star studded and sold out LA show. LA, com what? Oh, okay, the LA's comedy. Oh, so he did a show at the Hollywood Bowl. That's sick. The other superstar comedian did not repeat any of the jokes that had been loudly rejected by the members of the community, GLAD and a National Black Justice Coalition. But look who's coming after him. The LGBT community, I don't know what GLAD is, but the black justice community is coming after him too. That's mad, isn't it? He found his nose at the notion that the counterculture, while promoting messages of kindness and love, Chappelle shared the marquee with a screening of the untitled Dave Chappelle documentary. Oh, wow, it's cool. Directed by American Factory Oscar winners um, Steve Bugner and Julia Wright. That offers an inside look at the last year's summer camp series. Wow, I can't wait to watch that. Um, mounted at the Wiring Pavilion near Chappelle's home in Yellow Springs, Ohio, the more than 50 shows served to re. re uh, uh, reinvigorate the small town uh, during a dark days of COVID-19 pandemic as it played host to a circle of famous friends. Um, some of some of them were on the bill tonight, including Soup Dog, Steve Curley, the, the DJ Jersey Jeff, Stevie Wonder, Poet, and Amir Suleiman, Nas, Lizzo, and singing, uh, what, and singing John Hammond. John Ham sung. Lizzo and John Ham singing on stage. Bruv, he's got the, that's what I love about Dead Chipotle, look at those pictures. He's got the most random celebrity friends, man. He just seems like such a good hang. He obviously spends too much time in bars drinking on his own, but he does seem like a good hang. Comedian Jeff Ross kicked off the program with a short set followed by a screening of the film with one attendee describing it as moving, then came Chappelle dressed in a suit with his wife and a cigarette in hand for the main event that saw him being heralded on the mic on numerous occasions as the mic, as the greatest living comic. It, uh, if this is what is being cancelled, it's like, I love it, said the 48 year old in response to the standing ovation the line the many more like it was greeted by raptors applause from the crowd which included a mask brad pitt tiffany haddish donna rawlings chuck law sterling k brown and others at another point he was more blunt said fuck twitter fuck nbc news fuck abc all these stupid ass networks i'm not talking to them i'm talking to you this is real life that's true i, I love that line his voice is in a special like fuck twitter it's not real life right? it's such a poignant and simple line but i think for a lot of celebrities who do get themselves wrapped up around cancellations on there and mobs and shit it does represent a very small um 
you know proportion of people's kind of usage of the internet in general and maybe even social media and also it's not reflective of what's going on in the actual real world some of the controversies you get kind of obsessed with and kind of caught up in on twitter you try and repeat them in a pub somewhere and people are looking at you like what what the fuck are you talking about German people don't have no idea what you're saying it continues says that but um but that's precisely what the lgbtq community and in particular trans women have rejected to Chappelle's used their real lives and bodies and gender identity as a punchline for the closer he said gender is a fact every human being in this room every human being on the earth had to pass through the legs of a woman to be on this earth that is a fact he says in the special is his last um of a string of netflix specials that also included sticks and stones equanimity and the bird revelation he also sided with harry potter jfk author yeah harry potter author jfk rowling um, by identifying as a uh, team's turf, a term that means trans exclusionary radical feminist, an ideology that excludes trans women as women. The special currently number four on Netflix top US top 100 list. Why can't I read out loud? The special currently number four on Netflix top US uh, 10 list is a streamer's most popular title. Also features jabs at white gays and the Me Too movement and lesbians, among others. I don't hate gay people. He said, I respect the shit out of you. Not all of you. He says, I'm not that fond of the newer gays. Too sensitive, too brittle. I miss the old gays, the Stonewall gays. They didn't take shit from anybody. <laughs> it's funny because the, the things he's saying is what, they, is what Joey Diaz says, right? He like, he misses when white people used to be white people, when they used to be tough and kind of centered and principled same with the gays i miss gays when they used to be actual gay people where they used to kind of you know fight people in the street had to kind of struggle for real things now they're complaining about you know not be able to go into bathrooms and shit i mean that kind of stuff and i fucking loved it again don't take stuff too seriously it's just jokes and even if it is too serious just turn it off do you know what i mean this this whole cancellation stuff is so bizarre i feel like, especially when it comes to stuff like netflix you don't have to watch this stuff like and again it's not like he's a rallying cry that he's kind of shouting from the rooftops to get people to pick up their bats and go to flipping doors on superstores and whack people around the heads that's not what he's doing he's just saying we should be all equal if we're all equal let's take the piss out of each other in order to kind of bring us all together if not we're going to be more separated than we're going to be together it's just going to lead to a more divided world as it already is at the moment in the last few days since close of release, Chappelle has received a condemnation from the MBJC, which called for the special to be pulled from the streamer. What the fuck is the MBJC? With the 2021 attract to be the deadliest year of the record change in the people in the United States, Netflix should know better. What do they think he's gonna be the flipping he is the Hitler of the trans community? Like, are you for real? Perpetuating transphobia, perpetuates violence. Netflix should um immediately pull closer from his platform and directly apologize to the community. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I've never believed in this whole like words is violence thing. Maybe because I've actually been involved in fights and I've actually trained in martial arts and combat sports and I've actually played football and played sports in general and got involved in scraps in that way. Words can never be violence because vi when, when violence happens, you know what violence is. Violence hurts. Violence leaves sometimes long lasting damage. Violence can, you know, um, lead to sometimes you losing your life, losing a limb. Do you know what I mean? Having, you know, life alterating injuries. Like it's not, it's not to be played with. Words can never be violence. Never. Never in a million years. Never. Especially words that are meant to be presented as jokes. Like you just need to just take a deep breath and relax. Like, I don't know, man. Because then what it does, it cheapens when somebody actually says something really offensive to you. It kind of takes away. It's like if you brand everybody a racist because they don't share your view on you know, diversity or multiculturalism, wherever it may be. When racism actually comes at your door, how can you point that out? And how can anyone take you seriously? Because you've branded everybody and everything a racist. Everyone's a neo-Nazi. Everyone's a white supremacist. Like, come on, man. They do exist, of course. White supremacy does exist in some way, shape or form. There are structures in place that are basically denying um, people the ability to move socioeconomically among different places. Look at who's the guy that built New York, who effectively put in things in place that basically denied black and brown people from living in certain areas of that of New York in general, right, of that state. So, of course, that does exist. We know it does. But if you call everything white supremacy, how can you then address it? How can you address it? But yeah, um, loads of stuff to get into. But yeah, um, big applause for Dave Chappelle. Really recommend you check out that special. Legitimately one of my more favorite ones i think out of the four that he's done so far with um netflix i think in general and i think it's such a refreshing thing to hear somebody saying the things that i'm kind of thinking in my head but i don't maybe have the courage or the fortitude or the intelligence or the wherewithal or the you know the vocabulary to say it the way he does and he kind of punches it really well the the certain words that he uses the gaps and the pauses the widening of his eyes the little stars he does like he's just so good 
The only other thing I don't like about this thing, he doesn't smoke a cigarette. I wanted to see him smoke a cigarette because that's always a cool bit to see him smoke a cigarette because like, you rarely see people smoking cigarettes the way he does. He smokes cigarettes like he's smoking a joint, like it's really pleasurable. It's rare you see people do that now. Um, so that's pretty cool to see. But again, we didn't see him smoking a cigarette, but we definitely saw him baby, basically delivering maybe one of the best specials I've seen in a very long time. So big up Dave Chappelle. He is the GOAT, obviously is the GOAT. Um, I know it's difficult for other fans of comedy because they are used to seeing Dave Chappelle being the funny jokey jokey guy but the guy that he is now is i think far more important to the culture than the jokey jokey version i think you can leave that to other comedians i think he's kind of transcended that and it's great to see him not kind of using not kind of getting to that platform and kind of becoming more like dull and blunt no yeah kind of yeah kind of being a bit more safe right neutering himself no if anything he's actually going in even harder in the paint um even though he's more famous you know i mean so that's pretty sick to see man I'm, I'm not gonna lie it's pretty sick to see so let's move on from that one what else we want to see um we want to talk about oh let's talk about this this is pretty cool let's talk about the balenciaga show legitimately maybe one of my favorite shows that happened during paris fashion week um again another reminder of just how amazing demner is as, as a designer and i think nowadays it feels like he's getting the respect that he deserves i think oddly enough even though i didn't i didn't understand it and i was really angry about it because i'm a i love it it's legitimately one of my favorite brands in vetemar but I do understand now why he decided to kind of step away publicly and kind of distance himself from that brand and give it to whoever he gave it to, even though I still think he does some stuff for it secretly. But still, and just commit himself to doing Balenciaga only because I think people are now taking him a lot more serious as a designer because he's not doing the kind of irony plaid, the irony clad stuff he was doing at Vetemar, which is kind of, it felt like a a teenage angst of somebody that always wanted to get involved in fashion, finally got involved in fashion, got all the love and adjacent they wanted, but kind of despised and sort of like um, just yeah kind of despised the adoration they were getting because they were like oh you didn't care about me when i was outside the outside in georgia or interning in these like, random houses and places not getting recognition i wanted and all of a sudden i'm the darling of the scene everyone wants to be my friend it kind of felt that way but anyway that aside he stepped you know directly into the balenciaga thing he's obviously doing couture there now and he's doing that full time he's taking that more seriously and it feels like people are now giving him the love and adoration that he kind of needs and deserves for the work that he's done over the years, especially when it comes just in terms of silhouettes and shapes that he's kind of, um, you know, revolutionized and basically created an entire genre, an entire industry based on his shapes of the cuts that he basically does from hoodies to trousers to blazer jackets to the length of coats and parkas. That's just amazing. It's fantastic. And this is maybe one of the most one of the best and maybe most forward thinking shows that I've ever think he's probably put together. Um, Obviously, there was a great um, Little Simpsons uh, movie or film that they put together um, because um, Demner is supposed to be a massive fan of Matt Groening, the creator of The Simpsons. He kind of called him up, basically said, you know, I wouldn't be who I am without you. And they put together this amazing little um, tribute to fashion and shows and in general and then kind of, you know, threw in some great jokes and some great kind of lessons about inclusivity and took fun about and kind of shone the lens back at the fashion industry and took the piss out of them. Like, it was just a great fun moment, right? Just to kind of lighten the mood. But what the really great thing I loved about it was this red carpet entrance thing they had, right? Before they headed into the auditorium to kind of watch the Simpsons movie. Now, some of the people that were in the show knew they were in the show, but other guests who attended were, were getting pictures taken on the red carpet, quote unquote, with cameras around and people shouting at them and screaming at them and, you know, um, handlers moving them along when they got their pictures done. And they didn't know, unbeknownst to them, that some of the people that were walking that red carpet were actually models that were featured in the actual final, um, you know, runway shots of the actual show itself. But they were superseding people. So it was like a lot of kind of, you know, are you the participant? Are you the viewer? Um, are you just a voyeur on the side? Like, it was really cool to see that kind of democratization, that kind of level playing field of fashion taking part. Like, we're watching on stream. We're obviously taking part in one way, like a kind of Met Gallery type thing. And the people that are there are also kind of not sure if they're part of the show, just there as a guest. It kind of really created this really cool tension and just made it a bit fun, right? Do you know what I mean? It kind of just made it a bit more fun, a little bit more loose. And we see some great pictures here, obviously. Boss it looking amazing. Obviously, you've got Dev Hines in there looking great. Like, just some great images, right? But let's actually go through the um, 
collection itself. Well, no, let's actually read a little bit here of the GQ review because I think this lady Rachel actually wrote some core cool pieces that kind of touch on why this was awesome. So this is courtesy of GQ. It says uh, Balenciaga takes Springfield. It says now that social media has made us all famous, it can be hard to say what fame actually means. Does it mean a lot of followers, a career doing the things that are special, or at least things everyone cares about? Perhaps it's about the kind of magnetism, or is it in fact simply the culture of fame that things that float around it that define it? That's why I started thinking at the Balenciaga show on Saturday night um, in which the fashion audience usually in his position of judge and curator was pretty brilliantly swapped into the role of star and then just quickly lulled back into the thankless role of spectator the evening began with an uncanny red carpet with attendees doing a step and repeat in front of the screaming photographers either on purpose or because they accidentally went the wrong way it was testament to the creative director Demna's ability to take the most banal archetypes and make you question their reality it was really just like fame itself sometimes you caught it sometimes you a bunch of people just take photos of you looking stupid there was a huge throng of french teenagers outside screaming trying to tell the difference between faceless fashion editors and the actual celebrities like elliot page offset and cardi b and once inside of the fit of the theater de chalet of the hamusun era opera house guests sank into their velvet chairs and looked up on the screen and where the red carpet scrum outside was being streamed suddenly a classic balenciaga looker in hysterical size black ground appeared and a number of attendees on the second and third tiers of the balcony many blamed Balenciaga employees began screaming and clapping oh we all realized at once the red carpet procession was the show right so it's incredible to see in it like so so cool um so you actually see some images uh read actually some more comments here from demna courtesy of vogue mag it says well remarked demna vasilia um uh that's a Vasal, uh, Vasa, Vasalia, yeah, Vasilia, yeah. Um, with a considerable amount of um, laconic understatement, we needed something fun to happen with an epic stroke of his genius for messing with the fashion conventions and absurdist social media commentary. He staged a Balenciaga return to Paris that was both fake red carpet celebrity studded, movie star premiere and a real one. He said, I wanted to do a premiere concept where the guests would uh, be the show for so many seasons. It was nice to have a social occasion to be again. I hoped that it would make people smile smile it was absolutely hysterical right this is what a great way to kind of welcome back the return of shows by doing it this way and like i said from the pictures that i saw of the street style image especially from vogue in paris it looked like the energy had finally returned new york kind of looked pretty work good as well but when it suddenly got to paris which is obviously the main place that people actually want to go to that's where the actual business happens and the actual big you know big ticket names and brands and houses are actually situated it was great to see so many people just like reinvigorate to be out there again and i think part of it had to do with with the kind of lightness of touch that a lot of these designers were kind of approaching the fashion with the fact that the models were walking down the runway sans a face mask too there's just a little bit of a inclination that we might be kind of get, going getting over the best the worst of times that we're in obviously with the pandemic um so obviously the show itself pick out some again just just imagine you're on the red carpet you get your guest there you don't know if you're going to be in the runway pictures or if you're going to just be a, a guest just kind of watching the show live streamed as you're sat in this massive auditorium watching you know um this amazing clip of the simpsons but yeah just incredibly well put together again the shapes the jackets the cuts of it all stuff that i love and i love um the hoodies the blazers like the model choices as well the bags the accessories i just look how great all of that is like just such a casual or um comfy look that's the thing he just makes he has the ability to take such like banal everyday items like you know this is a kind of long sleeve turtleneck top thing some lounge pants some great shoes and it just it just luxes it up i don't know how he does it it's just such an expert way maybe it's the education of margella the education of louis vuitton but even the hoodie right he's actually taking the hoodie to all different all the, that's not hoodie, that's actually sorry, a track a track jacket with like a scarf in between but still that kind of silhouette has been elevated to such a level now that it's now become somewhat chic. Do you know what I mean? Like this kind of babushka, kind of Central European, Eastern European look has now become a, something that everyone kind of covets. And it's just awesome to see. I'm not going to lie. Like his parkers are always sensational. Like, you know, I love, I love a good eyeliner like that as well. Um, it reminds me of like, you know, uh bands in the 80s and stuff like you know what i mean they're just amazing but look at the shape of that parker right you got that kind of balloon kind of bubble shape thing that he has going on where it's sort of like a a, a triangle from the side this you know the shape is going to be banging hopefully it will come in some great colors got great pockets like just awesome stuff it kind of reminds me do you remember the time reading an interview with rick owens where he said he always tries to make his jackets uh 
big enough. No, he tries to make his jackets with pockets big enough to stick a sandwich in the book in it, right? So people can kind of go out and sort of like live in his jackets and kind of wear them and wear them in situ and kind of experience them, get some creases in them, some folds in them. And I've always kind of you, thought that was a cool way to kind of look at fashion design, right? I want to make it avant-garde. I want to push the envelope, but I also want to make it functional. I always want to make it practical. People can actually use it in their day-to-day lives. And I think that's sick to see. Um, but yeah, so many good things. Interesting bits of footwear that I'm going to show you in the next sort of slide. You've got Jürgen Teller here looking pretty sick. He's been all over the place lately. He's wearing this amazing inside-out, outside-in um, Parker. Um, sorry, Parker um, overcoat that basically looks amazing and pretty sick on him. He looks like a great model as well for Balenciaga, by the way. Um, that's cool to see. So really, really loads of great stuff here. Let's continue. I think there's a couple of bits here I wanted to show you that I was really a big fan of. Where am I going to find it? Again, great shit overall. Great bags, great shapes. The color palette's awesome too, right? Loads of blacks, grays, blues, blacks, silvers. Do you know what I mean? Like, just really, really well done. Like, look at this. Look at this look. Look how great this look does. Like... Especially the model choices. Well, the casting's always amazing with Balenciaga in general. Massive acrylic nails. These boots are just so, so well done. Simple. And a, and a great thing about Balenciaga, similar to like Vetemar when that first started, I always loved it, especially when Lotta Volkova, what's her name? I forgot her surname, but when she was styling for Vetemar and obviously for Balenciaga, I think now she's working with Miu Miu and Marc Jacobs and stuff. But when she was styling with them, obviously she's a supreme stylist. She's got a really great style herself. Um, follow her Instagram, like even that with the mesh top. And that's a great Bergheim look. Um, it was always great to watch Balenciaga and Vetemar shows because you've got really great styling tips for things that you could easily find yourself in vintage shops and whatnot, right? Or secondhand or secondhand stores or eBay and whatnot. Like, look at this look. You could easily find a similar dress like this, a bag like that but trousers or trousers or shoes like that that could basically um copy that look or even this look that i love to go to the Bergheim, right you could find the jacket of the similar sort of shape and style to that in easily in some leather shop down brick lane somewhere and you can replicate that look and you know put that on and go to some sort of you know go to an event at the cause or at the color factory and look amazing like, look at this look how great that look that's like such an amazing look man really 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 look it I love everything about it. Again, Balenciaga is one of my favorites. Again, look at that tracksuit. Like, that is just Eastern European, Central European chic there. Oversized. Looks amazing. Probably going to see Justin Bieber wearing something similar very, very soon. But again, the entire collection was sick. I loved everything about it. Um, can't wait to see it in stores, of course. It's going to look absolutely banging. And then to end it, of course, we've got Dev Hines there. We've got some footwear, too, that was shown. Some new footwear from Balenciaga that's kind of interesting in terms of their shapes, in terms of what they're trying to do, trying to push the envelope somewhat. Because I'm kind of split when it comes to fashion shoes. I don't really like when they just copy athletic brands already that exist i think it's quite lazy i do prefer it when they try and do different things and try and mix things up a little bit but i also do like when they take the conventional standard athletic shoe and kind of really like take it to a point where you're kind of questioning whether or not you like it or not like the triple s is a good example right is take away all the soles it's just a standard athletic shoe right but then as soon as you max them you max out the soles and you make it triple you make the the upper really beefy and it's heavy and it doesn't look it doesn't look clunky well i remember there's one guy actually messaging me on instagram asked me if you could train in a pair of flipping triple s's like this guy's out of his brain but in general right, i love the fact that they're able to do that and take it to the next step and look at this this is basically balenciaga's iteration of a croc that's also incorporated stuff that you'd see from like a new rock boot right so they've got these faux i'm assuming they're faux sort of like metal plates at the front and screws and whatnot it's just a balenciaga i don't think it's actually a collaboration it doesn't look like a collaboration it's like a a full-on balenciaga um mule that obviously is copying what the crocs are doing and crocs are having a complete renaissance at the moment so i thought that's a really good flip and iteration of what's going on and then you've got this shoe which is kind of more of a quintessential running shoe athletic shoe but then they've put this massive tire essentially it looks like a tire that you'd find maybe from a, on a mountain bike or like a or like a yeah basically a mountain bike a cross country yeah yeah like a cross country bike whatever it may be and they put that on the outer and it looks so sick and again it's quite deceptive because it looks quite thick but it's not if you kind of think about the end of the sole and where the midsole meets i think this i think there's not much room it's probably just about you know a couple of millimeters so it's not as thick as it actually looks but it does look quite bulbous and shit and then it's got this kind of again this sort of distressy kind of look to it where it's kind of looks like it's been left because again i don't know how he does it i don't know if it's treatment 
where everything just looks a little bit dusty, especially the black shoes. They all look like they've been left on a shoe rack somewhere in the middle of some sort of like, you know, Goodwill shop in the middle of Ukraine that he picked up somewhere. Do you know what I mean? I love that kind of finish that they have with them. Again, this is just like me just geeking out on this shit because again, you know, I love them. Uh, them as my guy. Um, him and Rick Owens are definitely guys that I kind of look up to in terms of how they approach design. And then just to kind of go far out and really make you question everything, they've got these two models that are more futuristic have a little bit more of a different look maybe they're kind of all one piece molded i'm not too sure how they're basically done but they look incredible right in terms of how they look in terms of visually as a design piece very different to anything you're going to see in the market at the moment and again they make you kind of question whether or not you um, are a fan of these shoes or not whether or not you found the brand or not i love everything about it and again it's taking elevating like a standard african uncle shoe that you'd find from like some barbershop somewhere being sold at the front of the window and it's kind of luxed it up futuristic future yeah brought it into the future right future proofed it or some or some way shape or form and now we've got this amazing shoe and how it looks there so yeah balenciaga uh was it for 2022 was again easily one of my favorite collections that i've seen so far from paris definitely up there with some of the best and again a reminder that them not really is a league of his own man like look at that look with the jeans like it just looks great even like look how great these those kind of crocs look in person right look at that elliot page really. look how good they look they look so fucking good they're gonna be really popular when they come out though you know if you already know they're gonna be popular if those i forgot who did them was it Blanchard? Yeah, Blanchard did a collaboration with Crocs before, right? They were super stacked and they were high and they sold out in minutes. So I'm assuming they're going to be fairly expensive and fairly popular with people too. So yeah, big up Denma, big up Blanchard for, I mean, sorry, spring 2022, ready to wear collection. Easily one of my favorites that I saw during Paris Fashion Week. No doubt, no doubt. And if we didn't get any more, or if we couldn't get any more cringy and love and in love with um, Demna, we've got this amazing news courtesy of Hypebeast. This, look at that. Balenciaga have created a travel pillar with the incorporated hood. Now, I would have preferred if the hood actually came with a mask built in, like one of those masks that you saw Kim and Kanye wearing from Balenciaga or from early Vetamon collections. That would have been pretty sick to watch, but this is a pretty cool idea, isn't it? They've taken the travel pillar that you're all kind of familiar with. Um, the, it doesn't necessarily work the way I think it's meant to work. I don't necessarily feel comfortable even sleeping in it. I just use it because everyone else uses it kind of thing, but it's not really the most practical thing to sleep in. I think either you sleep on a plane or you don't sleep in the plane i don't think you're gonna get many aids i usually like to have a little you know a couple of joints or a couple of puffs of a joint before i do go on the plane or not a couple of joints because i'll be comatose just to kind of get me kind of steady and whatnot but i don't think these sort of things actually do much in the grand scheme of things but i still love this as a design so so cool um so it's kind of following up on the show. The 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 price fashion demos labels dropped another object. The house's object line has been on top form as of late, having delivered a bunny iPhone case, um, AirPod case, and a water bottle and an array of sneaker cubes in just a handful of weeks. For its travel pillow, the Balenciaga maintains the expected level of luxury by serving a flat accessory in 100% cotton that's finished with medium fleece feel. So it's going to be great feeling, look wise, great great quality of course but it's definitely going to make you question your fandom for um, balenciaga and your need and utility to have such an item to pay 650 dollars for it and it's fucking wild designed like a top part of the hoodie the travel pillow cocoons your head and neck with a well padded support section that snaps together using pop 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 buttons sorry the hood features drawstrings as part of a traditional hoodie design and is very an um, Balenciaga move there's no branding on the exterior of the accessories oh really no branding at all there's no even because that would sell like hotcakes if this had a branding on it if this had Balenciaga written on the back these Chinese tourists and you know people from my culture would absolutely snap these up do you know what I mean for sure because it's one thing that we like that we share between cultures is the is the love of flipping branding and logos and whatnot but that looks absolutely sick I'm not gonna lie that's such a clever idea for sure now that they've done this again invention you know people are gonna go and copy for sure you're gonna get Chinese copies of this very very soon when it does drop oh it's not on screen sorry Chinese drop when this actually does drop so sorry the picture when this does drop actually you're going to see Chinese versions of it very very soon copies on Amazon and whatnot they're definitely going to exist that's without a shadow of a doubt I don't didn't I don't deny that um, no one can deny that that's going to happen for sure that's going to be a thing so you could probably wait a couple of weeks a couple of months and there's probably going to be some fakes and copies of this done out there but in terms of as a design piece right and something to see I think this is sick. I'm not going to lie. I think this is fucking awesome, man. This is a really, really cool idea. And again, it's just cool to be the first person to do something like this, right? Invention-wise, it's such a clever and simple idea um, that they're kind of utilizing, especially considering, you know, Blaise are known for making great hoodies. The hoodie design, 
you can latch onto the bottom of the thing you can it can kind of help you to maybe make some different choices in terms of what you're going to wear to the airport itself because usually i like to go to the airport wearing lounge again i shouldn't do it because i've been brought up to kind of go to the airport dressed pretty well but nowadays i tend to usually go in kind of loungy tracks that we kind of wear so this kind of might open up open you up to be a little bit more dressy because you've got a hood and a pillow that you can basically attach and put over your head if need be but yeah what a sick little thing man is it available now actually let's see if it's sold out that'd be interesting if it's actually sold out that would show you a lot about people in it and about what they think about the brand and their ability to basically print money with these things okay it's not sold out i about to say but oh it comes in different sizes mad isn't it okay yeah only uh, oh yeah jesus christ only one size available size small there's no other sizes available it looks like so it does come in other sizes in black medium fleece but unfortunately there's no other sizes available of it at the moment madness isn't it sold out bruv 650 dollars fucking nuts but big up them now big up Balenciaga. absolute bosses of fashion i love everything they do talking about boss of fashion we've got this i think i might have talked about this before in another show but white mountaineering are collaborating with uniqlo um a, a kind of premier kind of outdoor um out well, yeah outdoor wear sort of uh japanese fashion brand well known they make really expensive amazing um you know clothing and jackets that retail upwards of like 600 dollars and shit so for them to do a collaboration with uniqlo for me is perfect because it allows me to purchase and afford the jackets that they make of course it's not going to be the same quality as the stuff that they do but the great thing with uniqlo obviously be it being a japanese retailer and a japanese brand is that they still provide you with some level of quality like the jeans i have the t-shirts i have the underwear the socks i still have that you buy in a pack and whatnot um they're still bulletproof i still wear them to this day so the quality that they're able to produce and the for the how low the retail prices are definitely goes to show me or give me confidence that if i do end up purchasing this white mountaineering stuff it's definitely going to be of good quality and the range is just too good to turn down because again to be able to get a piece of white mountaineering clothing in my wardrobe um you know from the regular mainline brand would require me to maybe you know take out a couple of loans so be able to do this is fucking sick to see so let's see the collection itself da -da 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 courtesy of the unico website i think it's going to come out october 20th if i'm not mistaken um it's an image here for the men's stuff you've got this jacket of course which is a stand-up piece something i've got my eye on the men's um the, what's it, the men's hybrid oversized parker it comes in a, gr a green olive green a navy and a black and obviously for kind of difference and to kind of mix up my wardrobe because i've got too many black jackets i'm definitely going to either go for the navy or the olive of that one that's definitely one of my standout picks that i've seen um and then of course um from then on it'd probably be one of these fleeces i'm not really a big fan of this sort of like inners i've got a few of them i had a couple when i used to kind of wear that sort of style coat but these sort of like um um collarless inner things that people like what they call here they call it a light down oversized jacket i guess you can be for 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 this man's white for this white mountain area piece it seems like this is oversized and maybe it can be worn as a layer on top but usually this type of jacket are usually worn as a lining inside for like a, a kind of a show jacket that you want to maybe beef up a bit but i like this fleece i think this fleece is banging again any color but black just to kind of mix it up and make it a far more interesting thing to kind of purchase the navy um whatever that creamy color is and this kind of white slaty you know it's probably going to get stained super easily but these colors are really nice and then you've got this white mountaineering white mountaineering fleece oversized jacket too again look at the prices like you know apart from that hybrid jacket which is probably worth it over 100 quid everything's under 100 really really good prices and that um sorry and that fleece is 29 pounds 90 like so good but yeah this is really nice as well I like the look of this it reminds me a little bit of something that you'd find from sakai it's got a kind of Sakai flavor of it with how this, it, how kind of the paneling is done here with the zips and shit. That's really nice. And again, the olive green color is definitely the probably the better color to get out of that one. Um, they've got, of course, the kids section there. I'm not going to fit into none of that. You've got here a bit of white mountaineering. Um, Yosuke Aizawa, born in 1977, in the, uh, graduated from the Tama Art University with a degree in textile design. He founded White Mountaineering in 2006, which is shown in Paris Fashion Week since 2016. Aizawa has designed for a variety of brands around the world and visiting professor at tama art university so he went back to his roots you got the women's collection too which i'm sure is going to be popular with some people if i i guess this is a their version of the over this parker right so it comes a bit shorter it looks like um the pockets are a bit different at the front doesn't have the zip saw pocket here in the slit um the sort of like um yeah the pockets at the front are a bit smaller too 
different yeah different shape i'm assuming the what is it a gusset or whatever the the sleeve the size of the sleeve is going to be a little bit bigger it looks like compared to the men's one um and the colors are slightly different too you've got this nice sort of like white stony concrete kind of color you've got this brown and then you've got this black of course um let's take that out of the way go away you've got this um white mountaineering fleece oversized mock again maybe something some dudes can maybe fit into and would like the look of i'm not really a big fan of that to be honest is that it for the women's just those two items mad isn't it not that much really so it's mostly a men's collection but in the lookbook looks like there's loads of stuff they're wearing okay maybe it's just the women here is wearing a guy's thing yeah sure. i think she's just wearing a guy's fleece there so i guess most of it is unisex because everyone's wearing a bit of everything as you can see the ladies jacket here the the sleeve is super big in it compared to the sleeve that you're going to get here on the men's jacket so that's cool to see um so hopefully when that drops in stores as like i said i think it's going to be dropping in when is it let's see da, 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 da. i think it's october yeah let's just say october 28th actually let's quickly check that oh, why does it do that go away let's quickly check that interview actually that he said with um uniqlo and see what he had to say about things i'm curious to see what he's saying let's see what he said here hopefully it's not some video shit um white mountaineering is the collection how do you first collaborate with uh, Uniqlo? I've always had a theme, a family in mind, so I thought it would complement Uniqlo's life and philosophy to be a made for all, which matches my idea as a fashion designer. Okay, good to know. How do you translate the style? White man's theory, which crosses the urban life to the outdoors. He says sports and outdoors can be really incorporated into your daily life, such as going for a park or going for a walk. The collection isn't just about creating fashionable clothes, but also incorporating functionality for easy moments, easy movements, sorry, and details for outdoor garments, such as the textures and the heat retention to Technology. I went to put the technology and the knowledge I had gained through creating outdoor wear into this collection. Um, the the what you call it says the way you value your communication that can't be created through clothing is impressive. I've worked with various people over the years, and in fashion, it is very important facilitator of communication. I think clothing should also be considered a common language in the same way as music and art. After this collection is released, I would be very happy to see someone wearing the collection as part of a casual outfit. Oh yeah, for sure. So he doesn't want people just posing in the woods somewhere, pretending to pick up some berries. He wants you to wear it day to day and actually enjoy it. So yeah, big up, big up. Um, Big up Yusuke Aizawa. I can't wait to wear your flipping collection, mate. It looks absolutely amazing. I love everything about it. Let's quickly check out the lookbook. Again, the men's jackets. Are, that jacket's going to get copped in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. But yeah, you've got the fleece here looking pretty. Yeah, that fleece in, I think, again, the black is nice. But those two colors are definitely the best, especially for black skin. That kind of stone white color and that cream. Oof. Bang in. And then you've got, of course, that over jacket, that oversized um, o oversized um, down jacket looks better in the pictures here in the lookbook, but I'm not sure if it's going to look as great in pitch in real life. The kids' jackets look cool, but that parka, come on, man. That's got me all over it, mate. That parka looks fucking sick. Um, the women's jacket, again, looks quite nice as well. It's got a kind of a Balenci feel to it in terms of the parkas they make right there's a parker they did that was kind of hanging off the shoulders that kind of looks similar to this and um, i think maybe 2017 collection or something oh holding hands with the kids and whatnot it's nice yeah that fleece that yeah and that jacket so these are definitely the standouts the two fleeces and the oversized parker are definitely the standouts in this collection oh that kind of uh mock thing looks much better in this picture isn't it wow she's styling it hard with this pleated skirt the socks looks fucking sick isn't it but yeah, can't wait to see the stuff in store when it's finally available on October 20th. Keep an eye out for that. Keep an eye out for that. Um, next on this, what else do we have here? We have information courtesy of Hypebeast regarding the um, Salihi Bembry New Balance 574s. And I gotta be honest, they look a bit shit, mate. After all the leaks that we see recently, right, of people wearing them and people, you know, sucking on the bottom of the, sucking on the hill and kind of using it as a whistle or using it as a way to kind of drink your tears away from stuff that you've not been able to get on sneakers app and shit. Um, seeing the final image of what it actually looks like, I've got, I've got to be honest, especially on the foot, it doesn't look that great. It's one of those odd shoes that actually look better in the product shot vis-a-vis -vis on foot from what i've seen so far again i don't know and until i see somebody actually purchased a pair i might change my mind but similar to like um the sakai's right 
in all the iterations from the waffles to wherever they are i thought the sakai's looked better on foot with regular people wearing them than they looked in any of the leaked shots i saw in product shots they look really terrible the moment you saw someone actually wearing them in real life you're like oh that looks actually quite sick same goes for the kind of um undercover waffles as well that came out. i forgot with the kind of shock thing at the back of the hill on the hill cap on the hill cup sorry but these look fairly shit i gotta be honest they don't look that great um these 574s they look kind of horrible i'm not gonna lie um maybe it's just me um but i want to keep the i want to keep the same energy i like them when i saw the leaked images of them but the final pieces of them don't look that great the clothing looks pretty interesting and cool i think i'd wear some of these hats to go running in and shit um the outdoors wears again for for him as a designer i think it's cool that he's always kind of doing trying to do different and interesting things um that's always really cool but that colorway of that shoe basically exposes how maybe terrible they do look because the gray is obviously the best color the gray colorway of the five is a kind of classic new balance colorway but this color just like it makes them look again they're really bulbous which is not an issue but just in terms of aesthetically looking they just don't look that great i don't know they just look uh, maybe it's just me um this color looks quite nice it's kind of like atmos um vaulty pinky sort of colorway looks really nice in that regard but again he's not really styling them the best and then this one just doesn't look that great on the foot man i don't know maybe it's just me they don't look that nice i don't get the again i don't know what this is about whether or not it's a it's a sneaker heads you know um comments or unite sort of whistle in the back of the hill i'm not sure what's going on there um but as just the pure first impressions on foot they're a little bit underwhelming. I have to be honest, a little bit underwhelming from all the leaks we saw. And that usually is the issue when you leak something for so long, right? Like when people finally do see them, they either get fatigued or they just get like, they just convince themselves out of getting them because they're probably not going to get them anyway, right? That's it. Um, text here from Hypebeast following up on his water to be oh sorry water to be water be the guide to uh, to 2002 r that dropped in 20, june so Bembry is broadening his collaborative horizons um this spooky season with more collaborations with new balance the multifaceted designer has applied his own creative touch to the new balance 574 yurt so i'm assuming it's a new model the new Balance are introducing and they're used to using um mr Bembry as an avenue to kind of as a kind of you know person to kind of introduce it to the market so for sure we're going to see this shoe everywhere it's going to be you know every single shoe rack all over the place so you're going to get pretty tired of this shape and this silhouette pretty quickly and it's interesting that he would do this colorway as a collaboration because it's a fairly bog standard run of the mill new balance colorway right the grays with the whites and the um you know whatever it may be because you're more likely than not this colorway is going to get repeated again because this is what new balance always do of course it's going to have some you know some omissions maybe the, they're not going to have these little tabs with his name on it and shit but we're going to see that colorway again so it's interesting that he waits well, kind of waste you not know, waste opportunity i guess waste kind of to do that but it does also speak for the fact that a lot of shoes now at the moment there is a tendency to kind of go really base not say basic but to go really simple with a lot of the colorways right maybe five six colors max um you know not many patterns and not many different material choices i think that's really cool as a, again as a sneakerhead myself as an avid sneaker that actually buys you know sneakers that people don't necessarily like and then tries to make them look cool and interesting that's what you kind of like to see in those kind of shoes you don't necessarily always like the kind of what the what the dunk year of the dog kind of stuff that just looks like it's been run through a flipping um photoshop editor and just spat out with some nonsense in it right or some nft flipping ir generator you want something that looks actually classic something that looks kind of you know you can wear day to day and this is obviously it but it's interesting too because you know we're definitely going to see that colorway get repeated anyway digress the shoes um, of this assortment are certainly the head headlining products um it's here that the former yeezy and visachi designer pulls together elements of the new balance 574 and 990 v3 test run 0.300 and the archive 755 to fashion a semi chunky silhouette that bears and underlies the shaggy suede overlays now it would be really impressive i'll take a lot of my stuff back criticism if you tell me that he designed this shoe from the ground up if that's what the text is saying that he took all these elements of this shoe and put them together and made his own like new balance that like, this is a fresh model if that's the case then he deserves a lot of props because this is fairly decent looking considering he had the keys to the car because that's what happens if someone gives you the keys to the factory and the design studio and you get to make exactly what you want i trust me i've worked in nike id sometimes when you give people too many options they just make complete shit so the fact that he was able to kind of get all the keys to the factory and design what he designed now is is testament of how sick he is as a designer. Again, I don't know if that's true. It says it's a quote. 
but says you already need many different tools when venturing outdoors says Benbury the New Balance 574 year was created so that you don't have to worry about remembering every item because we've managed we've merged two um, into one with a whistle on the sneaker weaving this theme into the camping video makes me excited to see how my audience takes the campaign at face value and choose to year. okay so it's a whistle that you could use to what alert the police that you're getting eaten by a bear or something or to tell the bitches where to come or to alert the boys where the drinks are at. Like, what is that whistle for? But I guess it's going to be used in all different ways. That's going to be more interesting to see. And also at the kicks, there'll be a range of tees, hoodies, pants, and caps that are designed with Salihi's signature fingerprint um, graphics and hiking-inspired colors, along with the batch of trail-ready accessories. Mark your calendars for an October 22nd release um, via New Balance and note that the kicks will retail at $150, which is pretty decent, man. Apparel costs between $60 and $140. Either are props for that. Good, good on you for creating stuff well-priced that people can get a hold of and accessories are priced at thirty dollars. Okay, cool to see. We'll play a bit of the video here of the little campaign video. See what that's saying. Hopefully, it's not got your copyrighted music. Please, please, please. That's like Jesse, you that all the girls like, isn't it? Yeah. All right, cool. Jackets and stuff tied in. The jacket looks nice. Yeah. R.I.P. ASAP Yams. He would have been perfect for this, wouldn't it? You heard? You heard? Oh, that fleece looks nice. So that's a cap in it. I'm not going to lie. The stuff looks much better in motion, isn't it? In a still image. Not going to lie. But the shoes look a little bit... I don't know, man. When the bitch is cool, it's like, that's like when the, that text is in it, when the girl says, um, I'm on my way. Like, <laughs> that's the <that's> whistle. <laughs> that colorway was nice as well, that one he had. It's a pretty sick advert, I'm not going to lie. The jackets are sick, man. The, out, the coats are mad looking, isn't it? Oof, that's tough. Oh, that colorway is hard. I'm not going to lie. I take it back. That colorway is hard. That, that other one's hard. That white and pink colorway is fucking banging. That jacket is my favorite, I think, of the cold collection. Okay, nice. I like it. 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 And not a single English word spoken in the whole entire advert right so this might <laughs> go to show what direction he's trying to go in in it universal collection with new balance um you know got some brothers and sisters of course in the advert to kind of loosen up a little bit i like that as well i like that new balance is basically trying to um uh, what would you call it? shake up or refresh their image somewhat right usually back in the day when i was collecting or buying new balances there would be these images of like these old white ladies sewing them in the factories right 60 years old knitting these new balance shoes now they're trying to turn away from that obviously they know it's, you know it's made in new balance but you rarely see pictures of like factory workers wearing remember that was always the thing they did they loved showing factory workers like you know holding a pair of like you know um, atmos or mitre new balances or cricket on new balances and wearing them is like I don't care. Do you know what I mean? That Bradley from Stoke on Trent is making these shoes. I don't really give a shit. Um, it's not really cool. It doesn't make me want to buy them. They look shit on them. They're probably going to sell them anyway and just pay for his beers. You know what I mean? Like, doesn't really care. But it's cool to see them kind of stepping into the, you know, into the new world and moving things a bit forward. So definitely cool to see October 20th, I think, is it? October 20th, October 22nd? October 22nd. Again, price 150 US dollars. Nice pricing, great colorways. Again, the greys I'm not really that big of a fan of. I thought they don't, they don't look as great as they should be, but that colorway there, that pinky one, that one there, ooh, that, one, that one's banging. That one's tough. Let's see what Guam. And again, the jackets and the coats look sick. The coat that, that Jesse guy's wearing, it's fucking banging. I'm definitely a big fan of that one. So yeah, let's see what I'll go on for that one when it does finally drop. Yeah, he's doing great things, isn't it? He? He's doing great things. Move on. Uh, 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 uh. What else we have here? 
Oh, we have this one. Let's do this quickly. Um, we have images official of the Nike Air Max and Pata Monarchs that were that came out, I think, today. And are going to come out hopefully next week in some other international locations, some places here in the UK. I think Nike app or Sneakers app is going to drop them later on. Uh, but they look fucking sick. Like, this is legitimately Pata. When it comes to creating Air Max 1s, they're just in a league of their own. I had a couple pairs I ended up selling because I needed to, you know, have money to go on holiday and shit. So I regret selling them. But these are legitimately really really well done i love how they've got this um, wave motif going on um, design on the mud guard i guess you'd call it going around the shoe i love the addition of this little tiny swoosh which kind of resembles you know the co.jp air maxes that you usually get and kind of gives you a, a little bit more of a, a, a kind of 90s athletic vintage kind of air max feel i love the fact that the midsole looks like it's been kind of dyed a little bit but not dyed or yellowed in like a really aggressive shitty way um where you'd want to just ask and wash it and get it off but kind of died in a way that you would kind of pick up a shoe in again in a vintage store somewhere like might might meet your sports or something along that line i love the fact that they've got this kind of gray silverish mesh going on here too kind of harkening back to the better years of the kind of mesh toe box types nike sneakers it looks like they've got like a nylon um tongue here on the uh on the air max itself but just in general it just looks so beautiful and again Going back to what I said before, a lot of these brands, it looks like, are purposely deciding to kind of limit the colors and the um, material choices that they're kind of applying on their trainers to make them a little bit more evergreen, to make them a little bit more long lasting, to make them a little bit more classic, a little bit more modern, um, uh, something that could easily be kind of interpreted and picked up and obviously, you know, increasing maybe the um, likelihood that they're going to sell out if you've got something that doesn't look like it's been, again, run through some sort of flipping rainbow or whatever. But these look so, so good. Why is it not showing up in a full screen? Come on get up there is it showing it doesn't matter okay let's take it off there but yeah look how great these look man these look so 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 well done and again they're going to be really popular because they're easy to wear it's an air max um pattern known to creating great air maxes look at the tongue they've already got the pattern oh, ah, it's so good it's so fucking good man great job on these um team pattern for sure again you got the nice pattern on there on the insoles don't matter for me because i never wear insoles on mine You've got a bit of a naff chain there. Is that a chain or a bracelet? Look, or not. The last thing I'd ever want to do is wear a chain that has a Nike swoosh on it. Do you know what I mean? It's just not my vibe. I know some kids like it's just like, probably a kid thing. It's like kids that wear those dangly earrings with like logos and brands on it. It's like it's just not my vibe. I'm not into that. But again, those nice box team patter. Usually what they do, which is annoying, but again, it's, it's kind of harkening back to the old days. They usually have a patter only version or like a tier zero version that you'd only get if you're friends and family that has all this shit on it. Team patter, the thing, the other. The, the. So maybe the the GR or the one that we're going to get might just have might not have the insult with the pattern written on it and shit or the box might be different I don't know uh, they might have changed it but hopefully not um, let's see what the text says um, they ship between pattern and Nike dates back to 2006 cool you didn't see that for this new design pattern remax is the classic tinker made uh, model with the wavy mud guards which gives the shoe a subtle yet effective deviation from the original it also call out the the, the thematic references of the culture shifts and enduring influence the pattern had on the greater community and the large that's true isn't it right? ups and downs um, changing climate changing customer bases politics or not politics patterns always going to give you a crazy good collaboration whether it's asics to a fucking nike they're always going to bring out the best they're always going to bring their best when it comes to shoes i don't i can't really think of a shoe that they've done apart from the stuff they've done with it's not really a, it's not really a pattern thing it's more of a para which is a you know their friends i think the guy that does it i think i, I don't know i'm not really sure what's going on there but apart from the parachute which can be a bit hit and miss when it comes to the stuff that pattern do collaboration wise with sneakers they really are in a league of their own. There's no denying that. They really are in a league on their own. And to make things even better, to make me more fans of them, look what they did for one of the releases. I think this is in Milan or something, right? Um, for one of the shoes. So usually when they're releasing these shoes, it's always going with online raffles and shit, which are things that I fucking hate. The, the idea that you have to kind of win the opportunity to buy a pair of shoes never sits right with me. It always makes me physically angry because growing up in school, you know we'd have raffles right where you would kind of buy a, a ticket for a pound or for 50p or whatever it may be and usually you'd have the ability to win something that far so far exceeded the value of the ticket that you purchased right so maybe you'd able to be able to win a pair of football boots maybe a ball and a net or something maybe a bag whatever it'd be something that you're able to win that would be far more than the value of the actual of the actual raffle that you bought which would make it an exciting competition to take part in 
But this idea of raffle nowadays is that you get the opportunity to have a chance to buy the shoes with this raffle. That still doesn't guarantee that you get it. And again, the raffle system is rigged. People get backdoored and shit. I know myself, having worked in sneaker stores, how easy it is to kind of just get your friends in and let them to buy the shoes before the, the customers who don't have any connections and links can get a, a chance even to buy them. Then you go on to the whole you know, proliferation of sneaker culture and the fact that there's a multi-billion dollar industry and the fact that everyone wants to wear these shoes so there's more people asking for them, there's less availability, the, the brands themselves are kind of artificially creating scarcity by limiting the amount they're producing, which doesn't make any sense because you can buy an iPhone whenever you want but you can't buy a pair of limited edition shoes, it just doesn't make any sense, especially when you consider there's far less people buying these shoes than they're buying iPhones but we digress. So it's good to see them doing the standard thing that I grew up with, which is going to the stores and sometimes sleeping overnight and queuing to get them or going in the morning of and trying to get there as, as kind of quickly as you could to kind of make sure that you're not queuing too early, but also you're not there too late. Do you know what I mean? But still, first come, first serve in person because not everyone's going to be able to go out and buy the shoes in person. People have got work, you've got lives to live, da, da, da. But everyone can bot. Everyone can get, you know, apps to use and go on Discord and shit and whatnot and game the system to get the shoes to get sent to them. But it requires a little bit of effort to go out and go purchase them in store yourself. So it's great to see them having, to, having this option. Of course, if you're going to buy them online, you still can. And if you've got the funds, I'm sure you can be able to find them on StockX very soon or apps like Goat when they do end up releasing. I'm sure they'll be available now to buy very easily. But if you just want to be able to read to have the chance to buy them again, have that little bit of camaraderie and community and hang out with people, grab a munch after like that whole vibe of a sneaker launches lost when you're just kind of tapping shit and trying to enter raffles it's just bullshit so someone take this picture here so big up cake not crumbs um it says here anyone else think that in-store first come serve drop should return class act from patter if they are if they are policed uh, properly the people remain civilized i'd far prefer this over a raffle of course makes sense to release this pair in such a way considering the patter air max means to the community yes of course everything it means with the legacy of the air max and just you know again with their kind of history and sneaker design of course do it so this is the rules uh patter for their store only for this in-store release um rule number one one pair per customer two only your own size three first come first served so again it limits resellers you're only going to get your own size again it doesn't limit resellers but it does limit the chance of people coming in and trying to buy lows a size run and also trying to buy sell a pair that they want to sell directly uh, four absolutely no camping if you camp outside the store or in the same street you will not be allowed to get in no lining up before 8 a.m police will be present to enforce these rules in the neighborhood the line start um on the opposite side of the store if you line up in front of the door on the middle of the street you'll be not be allowed in six keep the location clean and trash free which we always did at the time we always go around with bags and bins and get people's mcdonald's and shit but it's just great time to hang around people man. i met some lifelong friends through that shit um, be respectful to locals neighbors and patter store located um near residential buildings so don't be a menace just great isn't it right and it gives everybody a chance to have ability to go in again you can buy them online but i think this is a far better way of kind of interacting with these kind of shoes and obviously getting a chance to purchase them yourself so big up patter and big up everything they're doing out there they're doing great stuff in general hopefully i'll be able to get a pair myself i've oh i really into the raffle i think if the london store does a, does does something like this i'll definitely go out and try and get them myself that way but you know probably end up not getting them probably end up scores of flipping wild lads trying to fight each other to for a pair but you know it is what it is the game is the game but bigger patter that way regarded anyway that's the excellent English episode number 505 thanks again for tuning in been a pleasure to have your company i've been chewing off your ear for far too long uh, i'm going to leave you now and hopefully you have a good weekend and the rest of the whatever else that you're doing and i'll see you guys again very very soon until then take care be safe peace <laughs>